pleasant agent of Nito Denko, a company that is also attending here. Uh, their technology has got approval from IRC and now they are promoting some Indians, company and the local government. This technology sustains the efficiency longer, longer than just bring water to load and more cost advantage than it. And the next one is the West Incineration Plant. Uh, Hitachi Zosen in India has already installed their waste incineration plant in India. They also attend this meeting. Uh, Japanese technology can reduce not only the emission of air pollutant, such as PM, but they can also help counter global warming by reducing the amount of CO2 produced from energy generations. For example, Japanese companies have developed technology for harnessing the heat generated in the process of incinerating waste as energy, thus reducing the need for other energy generation methods. This form of energy recovery is called waste energy, and it and is attracting attention as an effective use of resources. This means that incineration plant can solve multiple environmental problems at once. Although we have already gained many benefits from these technologies, I believe that in the future there will be even more application of Japanese technology that can help improvement, improve the environment. Japan would like to cooperate with India, people to think together and act together about how we can improve the atmospheric environment in India. We are confident of the ability and uh, commitment of Indian government and the people to tack the environmental pollution. But Japan can be a great help for India. We hope to work closely with India to improve, improve the environment, environment step by step. This will enable many people to live a healthier and more comfortable life in India. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Yosuda. In fact, we have huge opportunity of working together in this blue initiative, blue sky initiative, and I'm sure we shall be looking forward for the benefit in the future. May I now request uh, Mr. Yohi Mayano of Nito Day to present dust suppression technology. Good afternoon, everyone. I am uh, Yohei Mayano of Nito Denko, India. Uh, firstly, I really appreciate for uh, this opportunity uh, today. So I am here to uh, introduce our activity uh, development of dust separation agent. I'll begin by the introduction of our company. So my, our company name is Nito Denko Corporations. Established in uh, uh, 1916, and uh, now we have the 100 years companies. Uh, established in the Osaka in Japan, and uh, now it, the uh, head count is uh, almost 30,000 and the uh, net sales is right here, 500 million, billion uh, Indian rupees. Now uh, we are started uh, as a manufacturer of the tapes. So now our, our core technology is uh, manufacturing tape or films. On the base of those technologies, uh, we are developing the, uh, the opportunity uh, applications and the markets Nowadays, uh, our, we are offering uh, 30,500 products uh, to 70 
industries. Uh, this is, is the, uh, just an example of the three uh, industries. In the automotive uh, industries, it, it is a main uh, market in India. We are uh, showing the <coughs> high-functional uh, vibration uh, damping material and also. Awesome. And uh, have a look of the electronic-related the products. So we have the uh, sample lighting film, uh, radiation films, uh, the other uh, related adhesive tapes. And uh, the, uh, regarding the environmental products, so we have the RO films or something uh, to uh, pure, purify the uh, water, uh, water from the sea or the uh, uh, dirty waters. And now uh, we are looking for the new opportunity uh, in the India. The, uh, now we have the focus on the uh, social issues of India. Uh, here is uh, have the five issues. So we are mainly uh, focus on the uh, air pollution uh, because increasing the number of the uh, vehicles and the worst world, uh, worst air pollution in the world, and increasing the asthmatic and the, uh, patients in the in the in the India. So let's move to the uh, next slide to show the uh, detail of the Indian situations. Uh, this is the uh, background of our uh, activities. So we are uh, aware of the uh, current situation of India. Uh, this is the data of the four year 2018 uh, PM 2.5, uh, varied by the city, uh, city wise. It is source of the Greenpeace. It's the worst air pollution city is in Gurugarans. Uh, now I'm in the uh, Gurugram city, so very, very serious situations. And uh, what is more, so among the worst five cities, and the four cities are occupied by the uh, uh, dairies. And the pollution uh, level is very, very high, so 2.5 times of the Beijing or Shanghai. And uh, uh, this situation is, uh, uh, makes it, uh, Indian people increasing the uh, disease. And so, uh, but so it's a very big issue, but so we have no effective countermeasure uh, so far. So now that we are developing the, uh, uh, some products to reduce air pollution, so uh, in this uh, slide, so we show the uh, data, uh, dust suppression agent. Please see the uh, design concept. The uh, composition is like a limit, uh, liquid, just a liquid. Uh, we supply like a water. But uh, the water is gone uh, for after two or three hours. But uh, uh, this data suppression agent solution uh, makes the films and to uh, remain on the ground. So those same films prevent the uh, water uh, dust uh, from the going up again to the uh, sky. So that's why the, uh, uh, this product is effective for the uh, uh, reduction of the uh, reduction of the air pollution. And the uh, product composition is here. The almost 80% of the water, and the other 20% is organic materials, very safe. Uh, it's uh, composed from the uh, uh, seaweed. It's uh, like um, uh, organic materials. And then you can see the two plants in the water and the uh, uh, dust suppression agent solutions. It's a uh, very safe material, so uh, two plants is growing uh, still in the today. And furthermore, uh, five times dilutions when we use uh, those, ma uh, those materials, so non-toxic and environment very friendly materials. And uh, this is a slide that shows the result of the field test. It's a comparison of the water and our products. And the uh, uh, condition is here, uh, test area is very small. And uh, but the major site is one meter height uh, above the uh, above the grounds, and measuring the uh, PM 2.5 and 10. And the result is here. At the first day uh, of the uh, field test, it's uh, 
uh, dust corrosive rate is very the same uh, compared to the water. But the water is soon, uh, suddenly gone uh, because uh, very, India is a very high temperature company, uh, country. So, and uh, after two, after this uh, two days or three Saturdays of the, this uh, uh, field test, uh, this effectiveness of the uh, water is gone. On the other hand, our data suppression, uh, dust suppression agents uh, still work uh, to reduce the air pollution, and it lasts seven days. So, uh, in this test, our data suppression agent can uh, barely can uh, last for the seven days uh, for one time to date. And now we are understanding the, uh, the effectiveness of our uh, products. And the next is uh, talking about the cost. But it's difficult to say the uh, precise uh, uh, calculations. It's uh, just a comparison of the water spread. And here is a consumption of the uh, cost, uh, it's a uh, comparison of the cost in the seven days. We have the three options. First option is uh, to use a Chinese DSA but it's not allowed to use in India uh, because composition of the magnesium chloride is prohibited to use in India. So, so we have the two other options of the water spray or our products. So water spray is a day, so uh, total uh, spray uh, of the uh, one week is a 20 warmth. So it's very, very high laser labor cost. So the water cost is uh, only 10% of our products, but the uh, total cost is five times uh, bigger than our materials. And so now we have the, uh, some proof of the uh, performance and the cost simulations. Now we are to the uh, next process to, the, uh, uh, to uh, launch our business. Now we are doing the mass productions, and we are getting the approval of the NERI, uh, National uh, Environment uh, Engineering, uh, Engineering Institute, and now we are making the MSDS. And the, in addition to that, we have the, some offer uh, from the uh, company that they uh, suffer from the uh, air pollution. Now we have the doing the uh, uh, field tests, like uh, buildings, highways, or uh, construction railroads. So now we are collecting the uh, user experience, and then so we are uh, going to the uh, uh, to launch our business. The uh, end of the uh, four year uh, four year 2019. That concludes my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayano. May I now request Mr. Hiroeki Ito uh, to speak on waste to energy. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for the <coughs> giving the opportunity to present our companies. <coughs> uh, we are Hitachi Zosen Indias. Uh, Hitachi Zosen <coughs> is uh, one of the oldest engineering company in the world, founded once 38 years ago. <coughs> Today, Hitachi Zosen undisputed world leader in waste energy technologies. And uh, Hitachi Zosen has a successful 
track record of building more than 900 waste to energy incineration plants all over the world. We have established a dedicated engineering and project management office in Hyderabad to support Indian operations. Uh, about those and products are mainly environmental and industrial plants and social infrastructures, precise machineries and disaster preventions and machinery and process equipment, etc. Especially sales in environment and industrial plants is about 70%. So environment is our main business. Uh, we have two head office in Japan and in India we have two offices and one, paint jo uh, one joint venture uh, companies. Uh, the office is Gurugaon and uh, Hyderabad and joint ventures named Isojik is Dahages. Uh, our experiences in India, we constructed the waste energy plant in Jabalpur and uh, another ton tunnel boring machine was delivered in Bangalore metal project. Uh, about our environmental business histories, uh, in, 18, uh, in 1881, uh, Englishman E.H. Hunters opened an iron works shop in Japan. And in 1939, we built first waste treatment plant in Netherlands. And uh, in 1965, we built first waste to energy plant in Japan. Uh, it was a plant that started the waste incineration business of Hitachi Zosen in Japan. Uh, and, uh, Hitachi Zosen India was established in 2011. And uh, in 2016, we built our first Indian waste to energy plant in Jabalpur. We have been waste to energy business for more than 80 years. Uh, Hitachi Zosen Group has uh, a lot of experiences over 900 waste incineration plants all over the world. And there are 497 plants in Japan and followed by 213 plants in Europe. Currently, it is 129 plants in Asia, but we think it will increase more and more in the futures. Uh, in India, we built a waste energy plant for the first time in Jabalpur in 2016. Uh, they have been operating for about three years until now. In India, the construction of waste incineration plant has stood at the start point. Uh, Jabalpur plant capacity is 600 ton per day waste throughput, uh, one line. Uh, net calorific value of waste is 6.9 megajoule per kg, and electric gross power is 11.5 megawatt. Hitachi Zosen India was consortium leader with overall responsibility for EPC coordinations. Uh, next is, uh, in many developing countries, waste, um, um, waste amounts has been uh, increasing due to economic developing and uh, population growth. Many of these wastes has been open dump directly. 
without intermediate treatment. However, this method adversely affects the surrounding environment, such as odors, uh, groundwater and soil pollution by leachate waters, and the spread of diseases and the pests. Moreover, the open dumping has other problems, such as a shortage of disposal sites and the generation of greenhouse gases uh, uh, represented by the methane gas. Uh, in order to reduce the impact that such an uh, environmental uh, sanitary waste disposal is required. Uh, furthermore, it can contribute to the prevention of global warming by effect, effect, uh, effectively uh, utilizing the energy processed by the waste and, and generating electricity. In order to reduce the environmental impact, we suggest to utilize the uh, latest technologies. However, it is most important to adapt the problem technology that has uh, stable operating experiences over many years. Waste energy technology is one of the highly reliable and proven technologies to recover energy from waste. Adoption of appropriate exhaust gas treatment equipment can prevent emission of harmful gas. Depending on the composition of the waste, we can greatly reduce its weight and volume by incinerating the waste. Similarly, <clears throat> if there is one ton of uh, waste, 400 to 800 kilowatt of electricity can be generated. Uh, about contribution of Jabal pool plant to carbon dioxide reductions. Uh, the waste sector in India has emitted 57.73 million tons of CO2 equivalent in 2007. The incineration of waste and generating electricity can contribute to the suppression of greenhouse gas emissions from landfill and thermal power plants. Uh, although it is very small value, but this facility, this Jabalpur facility contributes to carbon dioxide reduction by waste incineration and power generations. Uh, this is an overview model drawing of the plant. Uh, the waste is carried in temporary stored in the bunkers. And the waste is fed into an incinerator with a crane. The waste is burned on the grate heat recovery from the combustion gases with the boilers. Uh, take, out three, take out steam and generate electricity with the turbine generators. Electricity produced is sold to power companies and this is the main source of income. Um, the harmful gas such as HCL and SOX uh, removed by flue gas treatment equipment and uh, released to atmosphere through the chimney as a clean gas. About our combustion technologies, we apply the large grade area and one grade drop that can be meet the complete combustion. And by applying the internal heat cycle Heat combustion air makes the adiabatic 
combustion chamber, we can achieve plant in operation without of auxiliary fuel. About flue gas treatment technologies, we apply dry process with lime injection to remove acid gas. Reaction salt, dust, heavy metal, and dioxin are corrected and removed by the bug filters. <clears throat> Finally, we have Hyderabad, Hyderabad office and MAM powers. We can work in the waste to energy business successfully uh, by using Hitachi Zosen's technologies, uh, volume and weight reduction of waste can be achieved. Waste treatment is immediate and long-term storage is not required. We can reduce landfill sites with compliance to emission value by using high combustion control and flue gas treatment systems. We hope the waste to energy becomes a great business market in India. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Eto. We are privileged and honored to have uh, Janab Firad Hakim, Honorable Mayor, Kolkata Municipal Corporation, Honorable Minister in Charge, Urban Development and Municipal Affairs, Government of West Bengal with us. May I now request you, sir, to give, uh, give your address to us. Mr. I. Sen, President, Bengal Chamber of Commerce. Mr. Arun Kumar Mukherjee, Chairman of the Committee of the Two Days Event of the Bengal Chamber of Commerce. Mayasaki Taga, Council General of Japan, Calcutta. Patrick Madison, Ambassador of Morocco to India. Dr. Ajay Mathur, DG Terai, we welcome him here in today's event. Ladies and gentlemen, I am glad to remain present in this 12th edition of Environment and Energy Conclave organized by the Bengal Chamber of Commerce and Industry today here. The conference is featuring sustainability and resource security to the context of urban sustainability. In this platform, I am sharing the endeavor of Calcutta Municipal Corporation, Department of Urban Development and Municipal Affairs towards the safe water of Calcutta, as well as of the other cities of West Bengal and sustainable management of sanitation for all, including specific management of solid waste and stride of prevent air pollution. In this regard, I would like to bring the following points. Calcutta has a major geopolitical importance being the hub in the eastern region of the country. Sharing international border with the three countries. The city is considered as the most popular live, livelihood destination for thousands of migrated laborers from the neighboring states of Uttar Pradesh, Bihar, Odisha, 
and from the other hinterland of West Bengal. Therefore, the optimization of resources is always a major concern for the city of Calcutta, which we often call city of joy. The carrying capacity of the city is also stressed during the day as the working population is greatly increased. Calcutta Municipal Corporation has major concern for air, water and waste, which we have seen just now, discussing just now. The issue of valuing water is continuous because of its physical, political and economical di dimensions. KMC object is to achieve the United Nation Substantial Development Goal Pillar 6, that is to ensure availability of substantial management of water sanitation for all. India's metropolitan cities for testing ground for the policy and innovations on the areas of wide reaching as economic and infrastructure development. The land use plan, provision of civic amenities and housing. We are happy to learn that today's program has a major focus on water secure economy and the Chamber has partnered with the renowned think tank Terai to present the regional dialogue of World Substantial Development Summit under Terai's flagship event. We are very much concerned regarding the scarcity of groundwater. In the last eight years of our region, we have focused upon the supply of safe and substantial drinking water for all urban citizen under the leadership of our Chief Minister Mamota Banerjee. We have become able to provide safe drinking water to the citizens of all municipalities in West Bengal. In many cases, the groundwater is being used to supply the drinking water to the citizen. In many cases, it is decreasing the groundwater. More importantly, we have scared of seeing the situation in Chennai this summer. Hence, we are planning to take initiative for rainwater harvesting to recharge the groundwater and taking strain act legal action against illegal filling of water body at any corner of the state. We are taking initiative to make people aware of saving water. Awareness program under the aegis of different municipalities going on constantly. And I would like to mention that the Chief Minister has announced a program, Jal Dharo Jal Bharo, that is the way, the program of water preservation. And she has herself was with, in the rally where we have taken up in the city to save water program. Like any big city, Cal Calcutta has its own challenges in air quality relating to the vehicular emissions, emissions from construction sector, dust, Resubmission, watch the industrial emissions, trans boundary po population, etc. The KMC, together with the other Department of Government of India, has strict norms for addressing vehicular pollutions. KMC will install fountains in parks and wherever there is availability of space. The move is to aim the reduce of air pollution and suspended carbon particles to get circulated, which gets circulated in air can be settled with the water of the fountains. I have just seen the presentation of uh, my friend regarding this problem. The KMC, KMC has distributed saplings to the as per the demand of the representative councillors for massive plantation in the city to mark Von Utsav. 
Sep I have formed a separate department in KMC titled Department of Urban Forestry, which has catered with the demand of supplying the trees to the areas where the space is available for the urban forestry. An expert committee has been already formed. Apart from botanics in KMC, the committee comprises of environmentalists and the experts from Jadupur University and Calcutta University. In a significant threat to prevent air pollution, KMC is taking strong measures to prevent piling up construction material on road, footpath across the city. Of course, you will say that till now there is many, but we are trying to remove those in the coming days. We have already taken up the project of vertical gardening in the pillar of different flyovers apart from green initiative. I will be happy to discuss with the experts today to learn more about the possible solution, bring practice in other countries with similar concern. We understand that this waste segregation is the key measure for waste management. We have only or already initiated a pilot project in some of the areas in the city. Solid waste management is very much in our priority list. Not only the segregation at store, but also to work specific scientific management of solid waste management with the help of renowned transaction advisor in cluster-based approach in Calcutta and other municipalities in the stand-alone method in small municipalities. Work for construction of transfer station, material recovery facility, net waste processing plant is under process. We would learn, we have to learn more from what the experts today is talking about the waste management here. The Chamber of Commerce may play an important role to enrich our knowledge and to create a public awareness. The KMC is also exploring possible, possible ways to energy technologies and to implement that in the city. We would like to take help of the experts present here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, we are closing the pre-lunch session here. One session we have on the uh, innovative solutions of air quality that has been scheduled uh, in the second half. Uh, we would request our president, Mr. Indrajit Shin, to please come to the dais and present token of our appreciation to the Honorable Mayor. And we would request uh, Mr. Arun Kumar Mukherjee to please present mementos to the speakers of our Japan Hour who are on the dais along with the mayor. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we are breaking for lunch and we will uh, start the post-lunch session at 3.10. We would request to seek your kind cooperation because we have a very interesting session post-lunch and our speakers have other uh, meeting uh, scheduled also. So we have to kind of uh, balance both sides We are as we are running uh, late. Uh, so requesting you to please join us around 3.10 when we'll start the post-lunch session. Thank you.
A hundred year journey is no easy feat. So, if one were to ask, how did India Power do it? The answer would be simple, expertise and experience. We constantly upgrade our skills by adopting new technologies. Digitization is... Power Corporation Limited has been doing just that, steadily and... dynamic pursuit of bringing natural gas, efficient, reliable and affordable energy for the sustainable and inclusive growth of India. H-Energy, a continuous mission of energizing the nation. H-Energy, an energy venture of the renowned Hiranandani Group is making rapid strides to create vital infrastructure for LNG import and distribution Hello. Hello. along the west Hello. and east coast Hello. of India. Hello. Hello. On the western coast in Maharashtra, H Energy has developed a modern LNG import terminal in Jaigar. This natural harbor is suitable for all weather operations round the year and can berth large size Hello. LNG vessels. Hello. For the first time in India, H Energy has set up a port terminal for operating a floating storage and regasification unit, FSRU. The port terminal was completed in a record time of 14 months. This included construction of a breakwater of 710 meters to protect the harbor from water currents. The jetty consists of an approach trestle of 284 meters. The jetty head is equipped with gas unloading arms as well as LNG transfer systems. H Energy has signed a long-term charter agreement with the leading French energy company Total for chartering its FSRU, the Cape Anne. This FSRU has a storage capacity of 145,000 cubic meters and a regasification capacity of 4 million metric tons per annum. The FSRU is also capable of reloading LNG onto other vessels as well as providing LNG bunkering services. On the 1st of May 2018, the FSRU GDF Suez Cape Anne arrived in India and was berthed at the Jaigad LNG terminal. The FSRU was inaugurated by the Honorable Chief Minister of Maharashtra, Sri Devendra Fadnavis. It's just the beginning of our journey. For invitees whom our, my colleagues are ushering inside. So post lunch we have, as you all know, we have the regional dialogue of World Sustainable Development Summit of Terry, which will be held in, uh, in Jan 2020. But as we mentioned in the earlier session, we have one session that is the Innov Innovative Solutions for Air Quality, which has been scheduled in this session, and it will be addressed by Mr. Virendra Patil, Director of Cells India, Jiangnan Environmental Technology Inc. Uh, uh, so I would request Mr. Patil to please join us on the dais. I would also request Mr. Orunke Mukherjee to please join us. Uh, it is technology from China for air quality. Uh, we have Mr. Patil with us who will be sharing the technology. It's almost a breakthrough technology 
uh, in flue gas desulfurization FGD area. You know, uh, for Indian scenario, most of our power plants are not equipped with this uh, equipment, this treatment, and government of India has made it mandatory to put up this plant by 2021. And this investment is uh, substantial. The bidding process is going on. And mostly the NTPC plants have started uh, initially. Now slowly the state electricity uh, uh, corporations are coming into the picture and they will be putting up the plant. Uh, this technology is unique in a sense. You will be sharing. Uh, than the uh, weight basis technology which is approved and which is being considered by most of the companies in terms of cost of operation and the uh, ease of operation. Uh, thank you. May I request Mr. Patil to make this presentation. Thank you. Good afternoon all. Post lunch sessions are always difficult, but I'll try to make it interesting. And uh, we, as introduced, this is a unique and innovative technology for flue gas desulfurization, which is removing sulfur from flue gas of thermal power plants. And this technology is removing that sulfur and converting into a useful fertilizer called as ammonium sulfate. First, we'll run quickly through uh, my company profile, JET. It has got presence in China and USA, basically Jiangnan Environmental Technology, registered in China. And this is a patented technology by a Chinese company. Having also office in New Jersey, USA, why USA? Because there are very coal-based power plants which needs an innovative solution to take care of their wastewater and cost of operation of these FGDs. So we are uh, addressing the US issues. Plus we have also presence in Middle East because the refineries also produce a lot of sulfur which can be captured and converted into a fertilizer. We got 300 such flue gas desulfurization already installed in China, which are working since last 10 years and converting harmful SOX into useful fertilizer. Now, before we start this technology, let's see this horrible picture. Why horrible? You can see this image is from NASA satellite image, which is showing the sulfur or SO2 deposits in the atmosphere in 2005 and in 2016. If you see China was densely polluted with SO2, SO3 in 2005 and because of implementation of FGDs in mainly thermal power plants, they have cleaning up and they have cleaned most of the part and that's why when I visited first in China in 2008 and when I'm visiting in 2019, the tremendous difference in air quality, mainly because of the stringent norms of environment pollution control equipments. India, if you see, 2005 was much clean, but in 2016, the SO2 deposition uh, started. And this is the right time to address this issue, because in next 10 years, the picture is going to be the worst, because SO2 is very harmful for human beings. And government of India has noticed this, and we have actually published the environmental protection equipment norms or pollution control norms two years back, 2015. But still, it is on the paper. Worst part is it has to be implemented before 2019 
but even the implementation has not yet begun. So we have been witnessing this, that there is a lethargy, there is a lack of momentum in implementation of this, because it has got a capex and opex cost. Now when we go for flue gas desulfurization, there are various factors to choose the technology, which is mainly the reagent, whether it is limestone or ammonia or seawater, what is the byproduct, whether it is useful or it will be creating nuisance like your fly ash. So these are very important factors. Another important factor is emission standard, current and future, because many power plants will be focusing on what is the norm by government of India today. But this norm is dynamic, these norms will change after five years, and that technology selected today should be meeting those changes. This is simple mechanism of ammonia-based desulfurization. It converts harmful SO2 into ammonium sulfate, which is useful fertilizer. In terms of economics, instead of limestone, which is 1.6 ton, will be used to remove 1 ton of SO2, just 0.5 tons of ammonia is required and it will generate four times, that is 1.9 ton of ammonium sulphate. And by sale of ammonium sulphate, you will recover 100% cost of ammonia. So this gives a better economics of operation of the FGD because of ammonia based. Where there is a high sulphur dioxide in the flue gas, this technology becomes handy because the efficiency is more than 99%. It's an environment friendly technology because we do not generate any wastewater, we do not generate any carbon dioxide. This is a basic comparison between ammonia process and limestone process. For desulfurization based on limestone, you need to add 1.6 ton of limestone to remove 1 ton of SO2, which will produce 2.7 tons of gypsum. And this gypsum will be inferior quality because the limestone in India is of inferior quality. So gypsum production of million tons from these thermal power plants will be another mainly environmental polluting issue. Because right now fly ash generated by these thermal power plants is an issue. But in future, the gypsum generated by these power plants will be an issue. And people are already addressing this issue to CEA that billion tons of gypsum will be produced and which will be not used, then it will be has to be dumped. And then this will be, we, we are arresting the air pollution and we are dumping into a land pollution. Plus we are generating carbon dioxide. So how much carbon dioxide? One ton of SO2 will generate 0.7 ton of carbon dioxide when we use limestone to remove that SO2. So that means we are removing SO2 and we are adding carbon dioxide, which is also harmful. But luckily or unluckily, there is no norm today for carbon dioxide. So it is a little breathing for the power plants which are going for limestone-based FGDs. But in future, if there is a norm for carbon dioxide emission by these thermal power plants, this will be another issue. These are the advantages against limestone-based FGD. I will highlight the two important factors. One is the auxiliary power consumption is lower and there is no wastewater generation because water is very important natural resource and because of limestone-based FGD we will be generating a lot of wastewater and this wastewater has to be treated but you know 100% wastewater treatment cannot be possible. So there is a water loss in this technology. Plus, the capital cost is 10% lower in ammonia-based FGD. The most important factor of this ammonia-based FGD is we are arresting that sulfur dioxide from the flue gas and we are converting into ammonium sulfate, which is a useful fertilizer. To understand ammonium sulfate, it is a combination of sulfur and nitrogen. Nitrogen is nothing but urea and we know all know in the world, India is number one in using nitrogen-based fertilizer, that is urea, because we are agriculture-based economy and we all need urea because we are using this uh, agriculture-based economy and we, we are using this fertilizers since ancient days. I think in 1947, 
uh, we had ammonium sulfate production, uh, fertilizer production plant in India. So that means continuous uses of this fertilizer needs more fertilizer in future and ammonium sulfate is one of the useful fertilizer and currently India is importing ammonium sulfate around 2 to 3 lakh ton of ammonium sulfate being imported mainly from China to India. So we can use this ammonium sulfate of a byproduct from FGD to our uh, fertilizer industry. These are some reference plant details in China. We have installed 10 into 200 megawatt, which is one of the largest ammonia-based desulfurization plant in China. And this plant is working last two years and they are generating ammonium sulphate and this generating ammonium sulphate is being exported to various countries. So it is not only controlling the SO2 but it is also generating some profit for that thermal power plant. So in terms of comparison of operation cost compared to limestone based FGD, the, it is in negative because the, by sale of ammonium sulphate you can 100% recover the cost of ammonia. This is another project we completed in 2015 May. This is very interesting to see the figures here. The PM content that is particulate matter is just 5 mg per nm cube. In India recently we have seen 30-35 mg per nm cube. Most of the power plants are emitting 50. Some of those are emitting 100 mg per nm cube of dust. And in morning session we have seen world's most polluted city, Gurgaon, has got maybe five times more dust concentration than even Beijing. So that means dust control is very important and ammonia-based FGD can help in controlling the dust from 20 mg to 30 mg or 30 mg to just 5 mg per nm cube. Because ammonia helps in agglomeration of the particle size, so to understand a little bit more, I will show you a small video on the technology. JNEP's Ultrasound Enhanced Sulfur Dioxide and Particulate Control USPAC, technology applies multiple absorption enhancement technologies to achieve high sulfur dioxide removal efficiency while significantly reducing the aerosol formation and ammonia slip. By simultaneously applying fine particulate scrubbing and acoustic agglomeration technologies, the size of the particulates in the flue gas after sulfur dioxide absorption stage is enlarged, which greatly improves the fine particulate removal efficiency. The ultra-low emission of particulates is achieved by means of multi-stage, high-efficiency demister. JNEP's USPAC technology is mature and reliable. The process generates no secondary pollutants such as solid waste, wastewater, and carbon dioxide. And the byproduct of the process is the sellable ammonium sulfate fertilizer, making the process very attractive and viable, both environmentally and economically. The major functional sections of JNEP's USPAC technology are the ammonia storage and supply section, the absorber section, the pump and fan section, the ammonium sulfate post-treatment section, and the control section. Flue gas system Flue gas from the ID fan enters the multifunctional absorber through the inlet duct. The absorption of sulfur dioxide is performed by improving the absorption system with optimized spray density, liquid gas distribution, 
and the oxidation process. As a result, high ammonia recovery and oxidation efficiency are achieved to minimize aerosol formation and ammonia slip while ensuring high sulfur dioxide removal efficiency and ultra-low emission. The guaranteed sulfur dioxide emission is lower than 35 mg per normal cubic meter, which meets the requirement of the ultra-low emission regulation and the sulfur dioxide removal efficiency is more than 99%. The flue gas with sulfur dioxide removed carries droplets of the absorption solution, dust particles and absorbent droplets. After the first demisting process, the flue gas enters the ultrasound enhanced particulate control device. With the application of ultrasound, the fine particulates such as dust and aerosol particulates agglomerate through collision and resonance mechanism, resulting in larger particulate diameters, which greatly improves the particulate and sulfur dioxide removal efficiency. Eventually, the flue gas passes through a multi-stage, patented high-efficiency demisting system ensuring that the particulate emission meets the ultra-low emission standard of less than 5 mg per normal cubic meter. Absorption and oxidation system. The sulfur dioxide in the flue gas reacts with the desulfurization absorbent, ammonia, forming an intermediate product, ammonium sulfite and ammonium bisulfate solution. Sufficient air is fed into the system to oxidize ammonium sulfite and ammonium bisulfate to ammonium sulfate. Heat from the flue gas is used to concentrate and partially crystallize the ammonium sulfate solution. The flue gas is cooled and ammonium sulfate slurry with controlled solid content can be obtained. Therefore, the energy required for ammonium sulfate dehydration is greatly reduced. Ammonium sulfate post-treatment system Ammonium sulfate slurry is further processed in the ammonium sulfate system through solid liquid separation, drying and packaging to produce fertilizer grade ammonium sulfate product. So uh, as you have witnessed, we are converting the sulfur dioxide from the flue gas and we are converting into a useful fertilizer which can be packed in urea like plastic bags and then ready to sell in open market. Now coming back to the last portion of this, the reference plant details. See, uh, the SO2 removal efficiency is more than 99.6%. That means we have seen in China when you use petroleum coke, or uh, if you use the lignite having high sulfur, then the SO2 at the inlet of FGD shoots up to 6,000 mg per nm cube. That we have reduced to 35, from 6,000 to 35. And in India, we have seen maximum 2,000 mg per nm cube is the inlet of FGD. That we have reduced to 100. But it has a provision to reduce it to further to 35 mg per nm cube. Because you, further reduction will generate more ammonium sulfate and more ammonium sulfate means you are generating more profit. Just by uh, spraying the water? Actually, it is water and ammonia. Ammonia is the main reagent. NH3 will react to SO2 and forms NH4SO4. So this uh, technology being implemented is one of the first world stringent norm by thermal power plants. It is meeting 5 mg per nm cube of outlet PM uh, and SO2 just 35 mg per nm cube and SO2 also 50 mg per nm cube. Now, uh, India perspective, we approach company, I can give a relevant example like CSC, which is a renowned uh, Calcutta based company and the top management has visited this plant. They have visited another 2-3 plants and they have approved this technology in the bidding. And very soon, because the Haldia and Baj Baj, these are the power plants where we are targeting this ammonia based desulfurization, which need an open mindset because the world is moving towards limestone based FGD, so everyone should go and follow limestone based FGD. It is not the fact. We should 
give a alternative and if everyone goes for limestone based fgd there will be huge production of uh, gypsum which will be an issue for a thermal power industry this is capex published by ca for ammonia and limestone based fgd it is on their website that means ca which is a nodal uh, government agency for implementation of this fgd has approved this technology and we approach ca and even ntpc and all the state electricity board gujarat state electricity board has also uh, selected this technology as an option to limestone based fgd and ca has not only accepted this technology as an alternative they have arranged one seminar where i gave a presentation and many power plant they have advice to at least go for both kind of bidding limestone and ammonia and if this technology is lower in capex and opex then you select this technology so it is not that you are going for only ammonia based fgd you are comparing with all alternatives available and based on the merit you are selecting it this is another uh, csr angle to this technology because the technology will produce a fertilizer and which is currently being imported in india and it is also sold at at a higher price because when you import there that means there is a demand supply gap and farmers are paying little extra even we have seen the china prices are less than india prices so generation of ammonium sulfate from your flue gas desulfurization will be the the best way of producing ammonium sulfate the economical way of producing ammonium sulfate that will make ammonium sulfate fertilizer cheaper and we know we are reading newspapers and all the media our today farmers are making suicide the poor farmers are not having enough money to buy seeds forget about the fertilizer so this kind of technology will be changing the entire prices of ammonium sulfate a fertilizer and this will be also good for indian economy and indian farmers with this request i will conclude this session source for ammonia is because if you google it sir india is number 3 in production of ammonia because all the fertilizer plants require ammonia so in terms of ammonia we will tie up with all these fertilizer companies who are producing ammonia they will give ammonia to us or we can import ammonia because import ammonia is cheaper yes ammonia is a toxic gas so how do you control the amount yeah very good question sir ammonia is hazardous gas and it has requirement of safety but good thing is that in thermal power plant ammonia is required to control nox also because nox has no option there is no reagent to control nox so all developed countries like us and europe they have all ammonia in the thermal power plants so there is a peso who gives a guideline to store ammonia good thing about ammonia is ammonia is very uh, affinity towards water so controlling ammonia leak is water spray so once you spray the water it becomes aqueous to add another point what we use in this fgd is aqueous ammonia which is 20% ammonia and 80% water so it is very safe in operation yes see this is also very relevant question existing plant layout we we have seen i am tomorrow i am visiting one plant in gujarat sabarmati is one of the oldest plant and there is no space for limestone by fgd and all the limestone bidders has raised doubt about the feasibility of the limestone based fgd ammonia based fgd because ammonia is in liquid form so you don't require any crushing system or storage system in a because limestone has to be stored like your coal limestone yard so ammonia can be stored in a small tank and then route it through a pipeline so in terms of layout it is very friendly thank you very much we will not be able to take any more questions please we are already delayed and uh, uh, mr kolan bro he is having another uh,
program where he has to lead. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. I, I'll share my email ID. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes. Please send it to me. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. We would request Mr. Arun Mukherjee to please present token of appreciation to Mr. Patil. Thank you. So uh, we are moving on to the uh, regional dialogue of for World Sustainable Develop Su Development Summit of Terry, which is which was scheduled as the uh, post lunch session of this year's conclave, and we would request the speakers of the opening session of the regional dialogue to please come and join us. Uh, we have Dr. Kalyan Rudra, Chairman, uh, West Bengal Pollution Control Board with us today for this session. I would request her to please join us on the dais. I would also request Dr. Annapurna Vancheswaran, uh, Senior Director Terry, Mr. Debe Mukherjee, our Senior Vice President, and uh, Mr. Orun Mukherjee, Chairperson Emeritus of the Energy and Environment Committee, uh, to please be with us on the dais. Dr. Ma Ajay, uh, Mathur was uh, supposed to, uh, he was scheduled to join this uh, regional dialogue. Uh, with the you know change of schedule of our flow, it has kind of got conflict with another meeting of his. Uh, as per we uh, move on, if kind of it, uh, if Dr. Mathur can uh, take a break from the other meeting he has, he will join us. So we may expect him during. Um, the course of uh, this session. But now I would request uh, Dr. Annapurna Vancheswaran, uh, Dr. Kalyan Rudra, Mr. Debe Mukherjee, and Mr. Arun Mukherjee. So, with this, I would request Mr. Arun Kumar Mukherjee to please take the session forward. This session is uh, a regional dialogue for World Sustainable Development Summit of Terry 2020. Bengal Chamber of Commerce is considered as a part, regional partner of Terry, and we feel very privileged and honored in this. And uh, the, their annual program is going to take place in January, January 2020. And uh, Terry does collect all the feedback from the regional dialogue. Uh, uh, one center is Calcutta, another partner is Bangalore. They have the overseas regional partner, I think, USA. So, and all these uh, datas, all these feedbacks are uh, getting discussed, will get discussed in 2020. Uh, the subject for this dialogue is what are secure economies perspective from the industries. So for the water crisis or scarcity is concerned, I think all of us are very well aware of it and uh, of late you have seen a lot of news item, lot of TV uh, discussion, channel discussion, and uh, our chief minister is taking a lot of initiatives, and with that, 
we are all aware of the problem. But in this session, we are going to discuss this issue from the perspective of the industries. Uh, how industry is going to face the challenge, what are the impact on industries, and what are the options available to them. We have the panel member, Dr. Colin Rudro, uh, he is chairman, West Bengal Pollution Control Board. You are uh, you, uh, possibly, definitely you are aware of him. He has been with us in the last two, three programs and uh, in our outreach program, what we always do with earlier pollution control, uh, earlier, regional. earlier regional dialogue. Our outreach program in Haldia, outreach program in Durgapur, we do participate together uh, uh, to, to uh, bring out the issue, local issue of these area and the solutions. So uh, we have uh, Dr. Annapurna Vanchasaran, Senior Director Terry, and uh, Mr. Debe Mukherjee, Senior Vice President, Mengal Chamber of Commerce. May I request now Dr. Annapurna to start the. Yeah, please. Thank you. Uh, I think it's an emotional. Um, time for us at Terry when we start preparing for the World Sustainable Development Summit. As has been mentioned even in the inaugural session in the morning and even now from Mr. Arun Makoji, that uh, this is one of the flagship events of Terry and we take pride in stating that it is one of the uh, one of the landmark platforms which discusses sustainability in its full form. With this, uh, I was also in the opening session of this regional dialogue, since it is a new uh, session altogether from the conclave. I was wanting to welcome Mr. Dr. Kalyan Rudra, uh, the chairman of the West Bengal Pollution Control Board, Mr. Arun Mukherjee, uh, Mr. Dev Mukherjee, bo both from the uh, Bengal Chamber of Commerce, uh, and all the other distinguished uh, speakers who will be in part of the ensuing sessions, which will lead us to the regional dialogue, uh, which will be taken back to our summit in January 2020. Uh, what I wanted to mention was that uh, this is the pre-event for our dialogue as mentioned. And as uh, Mr. Mukherjee has mentioned that we already have had in the morning, we released a document, a summary of the international event that was held in Monaco. Um, and that is essentially because we had a connect with that country and we felt that province and we felt that there was a need for us to discuss certain issues that are important to that small country, but it is making a lot of difference. And we had a discussion on electric by mobility as well as renewable energy in that uh, segment of discussions. From Calcutta, we move to New York, where in September there is going to be a major climate summit, which is called the UN Climate Summit, in which we will be actually discussing industry transition. The last session that we had just now on the technology, which is on FGDs, which is an important element for transition in the way industry looks at how it manages its business. So that is going to be an opportunity for us to look at how in the discussions there. From there, we would have another regional dialogue in Bangalore, which will be again on electric mobility, as well as um, we will also be looking at water in that region. Given that why West Bengal and this particular session on water secure economies, West Bengal has no, is known to be hydrologically safe, but not anymore. And that is why we felt that there was a need for us to start looking at issues ahead of time. And let us be visionaries and start looking at this. And now Calcutta has started looking at some of the issues and water comes under an issue problem while rest of the country is pretty water stressed. So it is very apt for us to start this. But let me step back and talk 
a minute on the partnership that we have with the Bengal Chamber of Commerce and Industry. It is no new phenomena that industry and academia work together. In fact, last year, uh, we had Ms. Mr. Anirban Ghosh here from the Mahindras. Terry and the Mahindra Life Space partnered and launched the first ever center of excellence, essentially, which is in our premises in Gurgaon in Haryana, to boost development of green buildings in India. And this is again a visionary thought where industry and academia come together. This is, I'm saying it with pride, and it's a privilege, that this is the third consecutive year that the, the business, uh, the, the Bengal Chamber of Commerce and Industry and Terry have partnered with the World Sustainable Development Summit and brought this regional dialogue in Calcutta every year before we go ahead with the main global summit. This is an opportunity for us to look at region-specific issues, then get it amplified at the global platform, which will be in Calcutta. I do have to mention that this would not have been possible without the leadership that is there in the Bengal Chamber and Mr. Dev Mukherjee and his team for having taken this forward. And we are really proud that the three years becomes 13 years and becomes 30 years of partnership. I would like to leave behind that the summit that is going to be in Delhi um, is a global summit. And while I welcome you here for the regional dialogue, may I also extend on behalf of Dr. Mathur and Terry a warm welcome to each one of you at the, Delhi Sustainable, the, the World Sustainable Development Summit in Delhi. I, we would request that all of you are present and we hope that we see all of you in January in 2020. Uh, what I am going to leave behind is a quick snapshot of what has traversed over these 18 years. 2020 will be the 19th summit that we would be hosting. And you would get to know the kind of uh, participation that we have and the intent with which the summit was started. So let's have a flashback. And thank you and welcome you all again. It's now or never. If we can limit global warming to well below 2 degrees, the diminishing sea ice in the Arctic will melt slower. Hundreds of millions of people will be saved from the risks of sea level rise and flooding and storms and heat waves and food and water scarcity and climate poverty. The coral reefs won't disappear. Many more species of insects and plants will live. It's tough, but not impossible. In India, we are striving for new paradigms for decarbonization, for energy transitions from fossil fuels to renewables, for leading the world in energy efficiency. We are creating new choices for our people and governments to build sustainable cities, promote sustainable farming, and clean our air, land, and oceans. But we know these solutions have to spread from the few to the many. Platforms like this play a crucial role in exchanging information, knowledge, experiences, lessons learned, and best practices from across the globe. This summit is a reinforcement of India's commitment to a sustainable planet for ourselves, and for future generations. Every year, for 18 years, we have been debating and sharing ideas with the best thinkers and doers of the world. The need for sustainable development is never more than now. We don't have time. We have to actually act, not only wish to act. As the stakes get higher, time runs faster, we will strive harder for speed and scale to achieve a fair, safe and sustainable world.
Thank you, Anuparna. Uh, may I now request uh, Dr. Colin Rudro to give your special address. Madam Anuparna and two Mukherjee sitting here are my good friends. And you too, many of them. Uh, I understand a teacher can read the face of the audience. I understand you are very tired. So uh, I will be very brief and very short. Uh, the topic is water secured uh, economy. I mean, especially industry em emphasis. But with uh, my humble submission is that if you consider the water security in isolation, uh, considering the industrial security only, I believe we, we are in a wrong footing. We will have to understand holistically. Uh, I was reading a book. Uh, it was Reverse of Empire by Donald Lodestar. Donald Lodestar is an American historian. He started the book in the, that way. He said, to write history of the human civilization without putting any water in it is to leave out large part of the story. Human experience had never been so dry. Meaning that history of human civilization is the history of water management. That is very important. Coming back to India, India has about 4,000 billion cubic meter of precipitation annually. Uh, this 4,000 billion cubic meter of annual supply of water is not supposed to be utilizable water. Government of India has stated that about 690 billion cubic meter of surface water and 432 billion cubic meter of ground water is that is altogether 1122 billion cubic meter is supposed to be the utilizable water resources we have annually. So this is the supply. But sometimes we create demand. Uh, if you look at the post-independence uh, water management scenario of India, you will find that we had some misleading concept. Uh, the spatially and temporally uneven distribution of rainfall creates two types of hydrological extremes. One is flood, other is water short condition, what we call drought sometimes. This year, Assam having the devastating flood at a point of time when Tamil Nadu had been suffering water shortage, acute water shortage. Sometimes we had understanding that we can achieve hydrological equity. That is, some engineers were too optimistic thinking that the water of the Assam can be transferred to Tamil Nadu. But there are many problems too. If you look at the misconception which uh, guided our water management scenario, first thing, I, first point I would like to share with you, First, that we had understanding that we can intercept the flowing water and transfer it to long way. Nehru, the first Prime Minister of India, had a vision that large dams will be the temples for modern India. We built so far more than 5,000 dams. We tried to intercept the water and then store it for next lean season. It was apparently pious intention. But if you look at the dam canal network data of the government of India, it says the transmission distribution loss of water had been more than 62%. That means the water we stored in the large dams and the water reaching really to the tail end of the command area is only 38%. In the meantime, we changed our agricultural pattern and there was the seed or beginning of the crisis. We introduced more and more water intensive crop. We denied industrial and other sectoral demand and gave a priority to the agricultural. If you look at the sectoral demand, before that I, I, would, uh, the, I will share with some other misconception. We had also misconception that our groundwater is unlimited. And we started to exploit that. I was reading with another paper published recently in Nature. 
it was dealing with the groundwater scenario of the national capital region, that is Delhi and adjoining region. The period of study was 2002 to August 2008. During the six years, the researcher said we have mined so far 109 billion cubic meter of water, which will not be recharged again. They warned in the concluding paragraph of their paper that if this continues, no less than 110 million people will have to leave the national capital region because there will be no water. The third issue is that we grossly denied the ecosystem services or demand for ecosystem services. The water is also required and that to control our existence. And lastly, we used our reefers as the most convenient outlet of the wastewater. If you look at the Ganga, Ganga has a length of about 2,500 kilometers. There are 118 towns along the bank of the Ganga. And there are more than 900 industries, which we call grossly polluting industries, which can create 100 kg BOD load per day. And this together, the cities and the industries contribute or discharge more than 6,000 million liters of wastewater into the river, that is the Ganga. And it creates a BOD load of 999 tons per day. If you go to the website of the Central Pollution Control Board, even that of our WBPCB, you will find no part of the Ganga from Haridwar down to Ganga Sagar is fit for bathing. The BOD load is alarmingly high. The DO is more or less within permissible, but coliform bacteria count, which should be less than 500, reaches to the tune of 2.5 lakhs, 3 lakhs, like that. So our reefers are polluted. If you look at the sectoral demand of water, where does the industry stand? 85% of the annual water use is in agricultural sector. Domestic, including livestock, is only 7%. So, we have about 92% in two sectors. If you go to the industry, power, etc., etc., it is even less than 4%. And ecological services, water for it, it is grossly denied. We had understanding that the water can be used for both irrigation and power generation. I cite the example of Tista stage 3-4 and that of the Gajol Doba Barrage in North Bengal. We had an understanding we can store the water there during the daytime and during the, from evening we can produce energy and that water can also be used in the downstream section from the Gajol Doba Barrage for irrigation. The distance between the two structures is only 16 kilometers. They started to release water during the, during the evening, and that reaches the Gajoldova barrage point at about late night. The demand for energy for water is during night, and agricultural water is during daytime. So this does not synchronize. When water reaches at the Gajoldova point, it achieves a height of about 114 meters. That is a maximum possible height that Gajoldova barrage can store. And after that, it is compelled to release the water. And if you look at the structures what we have built so far, these rivers are, rivers are not con only conduit of flowing water. It carries sediment load. This Bengal Delta is the largest delta of the world and that has been built because the Ganga carries the sediment load, Ganga Brahmaputra system, highest in the world. And we have intercepted that sediment load. And Sundarban Delta is really, really in large crisis, greatest crisis we have ever faced. If you look at the data, during the early 1980s, at the Farakka barrage point, the suspended sediment load was estimated to be 800 million tons. I had been working with the consortium of the IITs, we found it has come down to 170 million tons annually. Why? Because we have intercepted the sediment load upstream and disconnected the river. So this has created a great, great ecological crisis. So far as industries are concerned, 
I am also facing many cases in the National Green Tribunal and cases. Industries are not the largest consumer of water in this country. We will have to understand that we, make, we must rationalize our water demand in the agricultural sector. Otherwise, we can't expect that industry will get its expected water. Problem is that we often discuss in isolation, but we will have to have a holistic understanding how water should be managed. I can't change the rainfall pattern. I can't change the distribution of the rainfall. Say, Meghalaya must have rainfall about more than 10,000 millimeter per year, while Rajasthan will have less than 200 millimeter. This unevenness is very common in this country. But what we can do? We will have to reduce the water demand in agricultural sector. And how? We will have to change the, we, the selection of crop is very important. I cite one example. In Bengal, we cultivate a kind of rice, what we call boro rice. It is generally planted in December, harvested in April, which is the period when we have lowest rainfall. The, rain, the irrigation demand of the boro cultivation is 1,500 millimeter. That means one kilogram boro rice production needs 4,800 liters of water. That too largely exploited from groundwater table. This has created the problem. If you look at the Kaveri water dispute, Madam must be known, the demand created by the Karnataka and Tamil Nadu is more than what Kaveri can afford. If you look at the Tista water dispute, the same thing happened here. If you look at the Ganga water dispute, the same thing. We are expecting too much from nature. We are expecting too much. We are creating demand which is unrealistic. And that too largely in the agricultural sector. If you really, really want to rationalize this demand, the first thing should be right crop selection. And that is required. I believe we have never discussed this so far. That is most important. We even expect that even the drought prone areas can produce rice. The Bengal has the traditional culture of rice because Bengal has a very high rainfall. But if you expect that, water short areas of the South India can produce also rice, and we can take away water from Assam. I believe we are in, living in a fool's paradise. Second important issue is that what court expects from us, the wastewater recycling. Each industries are supposed to recycle their water. Not only the normal industry, but also in the energy sector. The recycling of the water is, the court has come forward with a new concept that they call ZLDs, zero liquid discharge, that in not a single drop of water should come out of the industries. Uh, they should 100% recycling of the water. That is the direction recently we have received from the court. Court is also concerned about the ecological flow in the river. It is not an arithmetic hydrology. That means human society is not the exclusive custodian of water. Each life in this society, in this ecosystem, has the water right. Lastly, I, before I conclude, I must say, our really, really, our climate is changing. Normally, when we talk about the climate change, we understand that temperature is rising. We are supposed to contain it within two degrees. Uh, major important issue is that our rainfall pattern is changing. I was working with 112 years rainfall data of Bengal. What happened here? We have a tendency of delayed monsoon. Believe me, during the last 100 years or so, the June rainfall has declined by about 48 millimeter. And that too has gone to the September. That means Bengal will have water short condition in the first part of the monsoon, followed by a situation when we will experience flood in September. So this is most important. I, I have very little options to combat this, but what we can do, we can think of changing our cropping pattern and reducing our demand, rationalizing our demand, so that industry sector can get more water. Lastly, I must say that our groundwater exploitation should be restricted within replenishable limit. I don't say that you stop groundwater exp exploitation. I say that 
you should restrict, you must be restricted within the replenishable limit so that nature can recharge it again. So this had been my humble submission. You are running behind the schedule. So uh, very briefly what my understanding about the water management in India. I have presented. Thank you all for your patient hearing. Thank you. May I, may I ask uh, Debe Mukherjee to share way forward from here? Gentlemen, I will pick up the cue from where, where from uh, what uh, Dr. Rudro has uh, very aptly summarized uh, in terms of the following observations. Uh, the first thing he said was to take a holistic view, a 360 degree view or a holistic view of water management. And I think that is imperative. The, to have a water secured economy, I was trying to think of a simple definition as to how one could have a water secure economy. And I came up with something like this to provide accessibility to adequate quantity of water of acceptable quality for human and environmental use. If we see the operative words here, that's accessibility, adequacy, and quality. If we look at these three aspects, which I'm sure the next panel is going to take up, then it boils down to two large areas generally speaking, maybe three. One is on the agricultural side, which Dr. Rudro mentioned. The other is on the municipal side and possibly the industrial side. But what is most important is the demand side management in these three. Because if the demand side is not taken care of, then we have a huge challenge in terms of water security. Therefore, Going back to what Mr. Desai said at the beginning, water becomes the central point of our discourse on natural resource security as an aspect of sustainability going forward. We look forward to the next panel discussion, which will talk about quantity and quality of water in terms of technology and its application. Thank you very much. Before we formally conclude this session, we would request Mr. Debe Mukherjee to please present token of our appreciation to Dr. Rudro. So we will move on to the panel discussion on water secure economies, which will be uh, chaired by Mr. Tapush Kumar Ghato, geophysicist, IIT Kharagpur, and geospatial mapping expert. And uh, we have as panelists Mr. Anshuman, senior fellow and associate director, Terry, Mr. Shurojit Lahiri, managing director, Sunanda Environmental uh, International Private Limited, Mr. Mark Pattison, synergist, uh, Limited UK and Mr. Girish Mohan, Regional Manager, Social Investments Program, IITC Limited. Join us, Mr. Tapush Kumar Ghatok, Mr. Anshuman, Mr. Shurujit Lahiri, Mr. Mark Pattison, and Mr. Girish Mohan. And we would request Mr. Ghatok to take the discussion forward. (coughs) 
good afternoon to everyone now the session itself says that it is water security and uh, the entire earth has about 96% of water some in the land and mostly in the the, in the ocean and etc and so if you take the even the water of the surface see it is about 30 31% of the water in the surface and the ground water and the oceans now we have so much of water and still we are feeling that we have to secure the water so how it's possible and some of the things we have heard in the dr rudro's lecture and uh, the thing is that are we going to pay for the water security or we will be reducing our consumption for the water security or we are going to replace what we have used and that's exactly what we need it for water security so i will not take much of a time and i will go with onshuman senior fellow in the terry to start with thank you very much thank you chair uh, good afternoon ladies and gentlemen uh, my name is anshuman uh, uh, what i thought i will discuss and probably share with you all is uh, been talking about you know need of and as you mentioned you know earth has so much of water but then why do we need to focus on it uh, the challenge is uh, not about the availability but the challenge is how to bring it to our use at the place and the time that we want uh, and of the quality so uh, our discussion is more on industry and i thought i'll just focus my talk on industries uh my presentation basically would be you know uh, about a little bit of a little bit about challenges of the water sector but largely on the water use efficiency in industries and i have few case examples to talk about uh, in those sectors which consume uh, most amount of water as far as industries are concerned uh now if you want to just imagine water this is something what we would like to see it as pure serene pristine uh, but unfortunately that's not the case uh, uh many places uh, this is not very uncommon scene we see water scarcity people have to walk uh, people have to you know face this kind of situation to fetch as simple as drinking water not uh, just a rural phenomena but also uh, you know urban phenomena in many places we still have this kind of situation including our capital delhi places in india where we have a drought kind of situation places where we have flood kind of situation and both the cases availability of water for usage of the quantity and quality becomes a problem for us whatever is available to us what we have done to it is this we have actually rendered it it polluted where it is not usable or even if we are wanting to use this it has an enormous amount of cost for treatment um so therefore uh, this dichotomy of how we are actually dealing with the water resources that we have at one hand we are doing this we worship the resources which is very very good but in on the other hand what we are doing is actually this uh polluting it so what are we what are we doing to it uh, you know i just want to you know walk you through a few numbers as well this was just pictorial depiction now there are various kinds of challenges across the water sector possibly i cannot go into details of all of them but if you look into by and large what is the kind of challenges uh in terms of the total water availability of the world this is how it looks like and if you look into the you know south asian region which is uh, housing almost one fourth of the world's population the water available to it is just around 4.5% so much of people uh, so much of people to cater to but so less of the resources at the place where we want it uh, yes there is water in ocean but not at the place where we want it and therefore the challenge so if you look into the per capita water availability we have actually come down to a water stressed state already moving towards acute water scarcity as well in some places uh, we have already seen that kind of acute water scarcity across the world now talking about the industries where are we uh, what is our water use unfortunately if you want to go into too much details of you know where we are we do not have enough information although industries do know about their water consumption but not in a public domain we have all this available uh, where we can actually utilize it for uh, but the information which is available tells us that the demands are actually growing multifold and by 2025 we are expecting around 228 bcm billion cubic meters of water to be used by industries where is this going to come from uh um, if you look into the industrial water use productivity um sometime back uh, what was reported was uh, you know this is uh, per meter cube around us dollar you know 7.5 if you compare to you know the the kind of consumption and the productivity 
uh, across the world, this is around 20, 30, and in that range, we are very less in terms of uh, productivity of water. And this has been verified and you know, kind of uh, watched in various other reports. Uh, water productivity by and large in South Asia is anyways very less in terms of GDP, GDP per meter cube of water. It's very less at US dollar four. Uh, water demand in our industries, India is growing multifold. You know, what is expected is, you know, by 2020, we'll be having around three times more what, if, what we have now in terms of water demand. Uh, but the usage, as I was mentioning to you, is very, uh, not very encouraging. We still consume around two to three times more, more uh, water per unit of, you know, our production uh, in our country. And uh, again, um, you know, the demand worldwide is going to be much more higher than what it is now. This is also reported in World Water Development Report in 2015. Uh, now, what is available to us, this is how the situation is, you know, in terms of the resources that is available, talking about the groundwater, we have reached a state when in most of our places where we need it most, uh, you know, where we have a population which is demanding more water more, actually we are, you know, going towards over-exploitation. Uh, you know, if you look into the uh, kind of, you know, places like Delhi, Punjab, Rajasthan, Gurgaon, I mean, these places are, you know, you know over-exploited, you know, look in, into Gurgaon or, or Rajasthan. 311%, what does that mean? We are, we are fetching more water than what is being naturally recharged. And therefore, we have reached this state of overexploited. We still have the country which is highest, uh, you know, groundwater abstraction. All that, uh, you know, area in color that you see over here are between critical to overexploited zones of the country. And this, these are also the zones where we have our industries placed, uh, especially the power plants. Now, Quickly moving to the quality perspective, I possibly cannot go into too much detail, but uh, what is already known is that we have been facing water pollution from various sources, uh, partially or uh, you know, you know, untreated uh, sewage finding way into the river water bodies, uh, industrial pollution coming to you know, the water bodies, all together rendering our water bodies uh, really in, in a very bad state. Uh, this is just figures about you know, Ganga. Uh, as, as latest as uh, last year, we still are discharging around, you know, 46, 45 percent of, you know, water, wastewater untreated into the river. Um, the wastewater which is actually uh, coming out from our cities is also, you know, not really collected. Uh, all of it is not really collected and whatever is collected is not even treated to its full, you know, capacity or efficiency. Um, so much so that we still have around 37, we just around, are treating around 37 percent of, you know, wastewater or sewage uh, which is uh, being discharged from our cities. Now. We have a national water mission under the Ministry of Water, water Resources, which has uh, identified goals uh, amongst various things. It also talks about the increasing water use efficiency, uh, improving the groundwater you know, management, water conservation, and so on and so forth. We also are the country who is signatory of the SDGs. And uh, amongst, again, uh, you know, provision of drinking water and sanitation, we are committed now to water quality management, efficiency, and so on and so forth. Having said that, what needs to be done is something that has been said earlier as well, but I want to reiterate. In all the sectors, what we need to have is reduce our wasted, recover our you know, resources which is available, really improve our efficiency and productivity, and wherever we can do, we should do conservation and probably possibly reuse and uh, zero discharge. All the sector have that opportunity, be it agriculture irrigation, be it uh, domestic, uh, but also industry, which I will be now exemplifying through some examples and case studies. Uh, what I'm trying to also highlight the fact is, you know, in the process we have an opportunity to move to a circular economy where we actually can have uh, move towards uh, move towards more of a restoration and you know renewable uh, kind of you know approach uh, and really reduce that uh, virgin material use to more of a recycle you know material use and uh, largely if you look into that aspect uh, it's more about extracting nutrients energy or resources from the you know water for example reuse recycle you know more focus into the value chain approach rather than just within the industry. Uh, and as well as resource in which all the efficiency co component comes in. Now, having said that, uh, there are various opportunities. Uh, you know, we have audited, we have been working with various industries, and all of them, uh, not even one had not had an opportunity of, you know, improving the water efficiency. I'll give you an example of power plant in more detail, but heavy engineering, healthcare, many other industries, all of them had opportunity of uh, different magnitudes, uh, significant enough to, you know, uh, go into interventions and implement them on board. Uh, Paper and pulp and paper, textile, thermal power plants, all of them. I'll just skip that. But I want to share this. You know, when we talk about the circular economy, one of the very important factors is not just within the industry looking at the opportunities of you know, wastewater recycle and reuse, but, all the, but also to see 
Whether within the sectors can we use the water or reuse the water? And a few good examples are already there for us to you know, look forward to. I mean, for example, Chennai Metro Water you know, treats the water and sells it to the industries. Industries like CPCL and uh, Madras, uh, MFL, Madras Fertilizer Limited, they're already using, you know, having treatment systems uh, you know, so uh, optimized now that they can use treated water from the municipal sewage for their industrial water input. And this is very much possible now, and therefore wherever we have that, that opportunity, we possibly should go towards that before we look into the new water sources or new uh, um, sources of water. Um, I just want to give an example of Israel, uh, which I've visited many times. You know, it's a country which actually you know, have used uh, water to its best possible way and is still moving towards uh, further improvement. Um, their population has increased from 1964 to, you know, um, I mean, four times the population is, but the water consumption has remained almost the same. Uh, how? Be not that their demand hasn't increased, but they have managed their demand by recycling the wastewater, almost as high as 80% of wastewater they are reusing into their system. And therefore, they are still able to manage their demand even though it has increased over a period of time. Uh, I just want to give you an example of thermal power plant, which is in industrial sector, the largest consumer, around 80% water in industrial sector is basically consumed by thermal power plants. Um, we have audited and I just want to share with you quickly. Uh, if you look into the you know, water consumption in any uh, thermal power plant, what you will find is uh, usually the consumption happens in, in a few, few particular areas. Well, just before, you know, for those who don't understand you know, the entire system and where water is used, in the power system we use uh, steam to move turbine to produce energy and in the process of uh, you know condensation of a steam we use a fair amount of water uh, which comes from the cooling system after a cooled water use and uh, this cooling system actually is largely nowadays in closed circulation although there had been these open circulation systems as well uh, the process of cooling actually has lot many evaporative and you know um, losses which are actually drift losses and evaporative losses these losses are basically made up from the freshwater source, which could be a reservoir or groundwater, depending upon the location. This water is sourced, it's uh, treated, and then is used in various locations, including the uh, boilers and, and other you know, uses like drinking water, ash handling, and so on and so forth. Now, what we did was, in this particular power plant that we, this is, by the way, the highest uh, you know, capacity power plant of the country, um, we audited their such three stages, and uh, I'll just uh, go uh, into a summary of it. It's a very complex process. Uh, we've measured the flow, we measured the water quality at different identified locations. And this is what we found. You know, if you look into the consumption, almost around 50% of water was consumed in the cooling towers, around 30% in the ash handling and rest in other areas. Now their specific water consumption was around five meter cube per megawatt then. And we said to them then around six, seven years back, that you can bring it down to a very significant level and somewhere around three meter cube per megawatt. How? The first thing that we told them was, you had an enormous amount of wastewater coming out of your system, um, almost 64,000 meter cube per day of water, which is almost 18% of you know, the intake water they had. Uh, we said you had a very good water quality, a TDS of you know, around 200, 250, 150. This is an excellent water quality, which can be reused within the system. I mean, 200, 250 TDS of water, you'll need a treatment plant to bring it to that level. Um, so we, so we suggested them and we designed for them a recycling system as well. Uh, they had the township which had a fairly high consumption of water, you know, in terms of uh, per capita, almost 15, 1,500, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, and, and uh, you know, a lot of leakage losses from the system, if you look into, uh, you know, right into the, you know, cooling towers and ash handling systems, uh, the leakages and the overflows that you can make out. Uh, this is again, uh, I, I represent this, you know, typically representing the water sector, you know, water consumption across the sectors in our country. Uh, this is a fire hydrant, not supposed to be using water for anything else except fire. This is a, you know, tanker, uh, which is sourcing water. I don't know what do I call this, a, a pipe or a fountain in itself. What is written is Jal Jali Jeevan Hai. You know, we are very wasteful, and that's the essence which we are, I'm saying, that's why I, I, I echo what um, De Mukherjee has said, Mr. De Mukherjee has said. Water demand management is something that we need to focus on in the current time, some 50, 100 years from now. I do not know where, whether that will be an opportunity still. But as of now, we do have. Anyways, uh, this is uh, the water balance that we established from them. And what we said was that there's a set of intervention that you can take up to improvise the entire thing, uh, entire water consumption, water usage. The first was, of course, uh, into wastewater recycling and reuse. Cooling tower, we said you can improve uh, the cycle of concentration and therefore reduce the you know, water consumption in the cooling system. Recycling of wastewater, um, ash handling, you know, which was, uh, again, very wasteful. 
and uh, they had opportunity from moving from wet ash handling to dry, dry ash handling and so on and so forth. So summary of this was actually you know, an opportunity which could have actually reduced around 60% of uh, water in the thermal power plant. Now I'm very happy that you know, they took up all, and, and the interventions like the wastewater recycling was not actually bad in terms of financial uh, you know, uh, proposition. Almost uh, seven to nine crores of uh, rupees annually was something that could be saved. And the payback period for the wastewater treatment system that we said could be designed was less than three years, which was very attractive. Now I'm not generalizing this, but similar op opportunities do exist across the board on, on industrial sector. Very quickly, just to you know, give you an uh, example. After five years, they called us again and said, please assess us where we are. And I'm very happy to tell you that you know, they already reduced by then around a lakh 21,000 21, meter cube per day of water, uh, just by that exercise uh, and set of intervention that we identified. And they brought down the consumption from 4.85 to around 3.2, which was something which we predicted almost in the same line. Uh, so again, uh, just wanted to tell you that there's an enormous op 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 amount of opportunity. I do not have time to share more, uh, so I'll stop here. Um, uh, but I think I, the set of uh, you know, recommendations or let's say the way forward that I would like to say about is you know, we need to have a policy in which we move beyond within the industry to a value chain approach, have all those efficiency, you know, recycle, reuse, improving water productivity, et cetera, taken into account, including wastewater recycle and reuse. And as we'll look into uh, the perspective of benchmarking water use across the sector, and that's where probably from the regulatory point of view, probably Bureau of Water Use Efficiency is something that presently we could be uh, materializing on. We have been talking about it for some time now, but it has not been yet there. Possibly that could help you know, on, the, on the terms of, on the lines of Bureau of Energy Efficiency as well. I'll stop here. Thank you, Chair. Um, if there are any questions, I'll take it up later. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I'll go for Shurujit Lahiri from Terry, sorry, from the uh, Environment and International Private, Shunanda International Private Limited. <clears throat> Hi. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. I'll be short because of the time. And uh, thank you once again. Uh, to Bengal Chamber of Commerce for inviting us over here. Uh, myself, Surajit Lahiri, from Sunanda Environmental International Private Limited, is basically working with uh, a company in UK called Vactec Tresto in the fields of water testing. Uh, as earlier mentioned uh, by Mr. Mukherjee and obviously uh, with other speakers, uh, we are in the field of uh, water quality. Uh, we, we talk about water security, we talk about water theft, but water quality is also one of the important uh, factors at this point, at this junction, uh, which we are dealing with. Uh, we, are, we are largely uh, working with Government of West Bengal, with the Public Health Engineering Department. Uh, we are working for the last six years, uh, largely uh, into the rural sector of water quality. I'll just quickly go through. Uh, so basically, we, we call it a smart water quality management system, as you can see on your screens. So it's basically, uh, it's a support system to the labs. Uh, I won't say it's, it's just one system that works out. There are labs, there are uh, labs in rural areas also, but what we have inbuilt into it is, is kind of a support, a portable lab, which we have developed from the UK and with our business intelligent tools we have integrated within that system, which then gives an entire program on water quality. So it's more of a program than just a product. Uh, we call it, in short, as OMAS. That's the on-site mobile analysis system. It gives you qualitative results. Uh, it gives, in, in accuracy times, we, we were discussing uh, with one of our speakers earlier also about the uh, uh, the differences that we have from the labs and also with the OMAS. So uh, in, in that regard, it, it does give uh, the curate results that's required. Uh, it can go to the field. I'll just quickly go through those slides later on. Uh, so if you can just press the one. Right, so this is a real-time picture that's working in West Bengal at this point. So you can, as you can see in your screens over there, it gives you uh, an on-site 
uh, testing mechanism that's going on with the field. Right, uh, this is what we have integrated with our system. So it, it's basically a real-time data management system. So once we are on the field and we do the testing, where does the data go? And what we have done is basically through an application, we then collect the data, which then comes into your server, a secured server, and from that server, we then come back to the dashboard arena where you can get your reports as you require whether it's for arsenic, whether it's for fluoride, or whether it's for any parameters that you require, you provide the reports to the authorities who is dealing with it. So this is kind of an advanced data analytics. I mean, there are experts in it uh, who can go on with it. So it's basically what we are providing as a company is a kind of a platform to all those decision makers who are sitting down and taking decisions. So the first line on water is water quality because you're going to supply drinking water to many a miles, right? So you need to take decisions on spot. And this is where we come in. We give you the system which provides your platform to take decisions. As you can see on your screen, uh, and this is the second part of the data analytics which we are trying to portray, is when we are reaching out with the OMAS, we reach out to the grassroots, right? We reach out to the schools in rural areas. We reach out to the Anganwaris. We reach out to the health centers because those are the areas where a lab cannot reach. And this is where we come in. The portable lab can basically reach out to those areas, those untouched areas where a lab cannot reach. So we reach out to those areas, we collect the data, and then we try to showcase that which area is contaminated with what kind of, whether it's arsenic, whether it's fluoride, whether it's iron. So that's the first line of reports that we can create to any department. <clears throat> right. Uh, another stage which we have come now. So once we detect uh, a kind of uh, a contamination in the water, what happens next? So we send an alert system through an SMS to the authorized person, whoever it is. So we can basically generate the report automatically from ground zero. So we don't have to wait for a few days that the sample is coming, you're, you're getting your results, and then you're waiting for the decision to be taken. You can take your decisions automatically from the field. Uh, as, as a company, Sunanda, we, as I said earlier, uh, we are just not a company uh, which is there to sell its product and go away. We are running successfully uh, many a programs on water quality with the government. Uh, we are running IEC programs in schools, in Anganwaris, in health centers, largely in all the 22 districts over here. Uh, what basically we do it's just a photograph which I'm trying to portray over here. It's kind of an IEC program at the grassroots level. So our team reaches out to those uh, areas where probably uh, the departments can't reach. And we, we send our people with the water quality testing team. Uh, they uh, do programs on water quality. They do programs on water theft, to trying to aware people, trying to aware the kids. And obviously, that helps the government uh, to reach out to the community. So it's kind of a community-based program which we are creating through water quality, which is, I, I, I personally believe that's a kind of a field work that is required. We, we talk of a lot of technologies, but it's important that we reach out to the grassroots level, and that's what Sunanda is trying to do. <clears throat> that's again one, one more slide where you can see uh, it's kind of a community-based program that we're trying to do in, in, in a district level, at a gram panchayat level, where you're going and awareing people, you're, you're connecting with people, you're trying to aware them on the water theft, because we know water theft is, is a legal offense at this point, and uh, people should know about it. Uh, we, we talk about water security, we talk about water quality, so those are the areas that we are trying to cover uh, in terms of a program. 
<coughs> this is where we are trying to head up from here on. Uh, we are trying to create the air, water, air quality monitoring system. Uh, it, is, it is in our pipeline, which is going to come soon. We are also in the fields of soil and agriculture testing. Uh, obviously, as I said earlier, uh, we are partnered with a UK company called Vactech Trestuo. They have got a R&D section, and we are trying to create that. So that's, that's all from myself. Probably the time is short. I can go in details later on. Thank you. Ask Mr. Mark, please, to join us for your next presentation. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. All right. All right. So we're we'll, we'll here. Oh, that's the next. One. All right. I'm going to have to remember my slides, which could be interesting. Right. Well, I'd like to um, thank the Bengal Chamber of Commerce for uh, inviting me to speak. Um, I'd also like to thank the sponsors um, and also the ITC um, Sonar Hotel for providing an excellent venue and a, a stunning lunch, um, none of which appears to have gone down my shirt, which is quite handy uh, for an afternoon speaker. Um, so I'll quickly just um, say who Synergist are. I, I, I assume that most people probably wouldn't know too much about Synergist until I noticed we were actually on the sponsor board, so at least you've seen the, the logo. Um, so we are a company that work in energy and water solutions within the UK. Um, Energy-wise, we tend to concentrate on uh, communal and district heating schemes, so we design and install uh, district and communi communal heating schemes within the UK. Um, we also have a, a, a water division, a water arm, where we look at water solutions, water programs with um, the UK government, uh, other governments within Europe, um, and the, the production of um, water flow regulators, which is one of the things I'll, I'll talk about today. So hopefully this is going to work. Uh, no, it didn't. Yeah, hey. Right. Um, just very quickly, um, I think I've actually managed to jump two slides at once there, so we'll see. There we go. Um, just to give a, a brief sort of background into the, the, the European perspective, um, the United Kingdom, um, I think it's fair to say we probably have a slightly checkered um, background in terms of, of water efficiency programs. We've, we've had probably 15 years of energy efficiency programs, probably less so in, in, in water efficiency. Um, but we now have a, a, a policy that the, the HGM, or Her Majesty's Government have set up um, with a company called WaterWise. Um, and that essentially is to, to look at mainly domestic water efficiency uh, opportunities. Um, certainly to, to reduce the impact of, of um, water use in the UK, to, to look at new technology that can reduce water consumption. Um, and that in, um, involves a, a, a non-government organisation called WaterWise who have been set up to work with industry um, and the, the water companies to, um, to implement that programme. Um, Italy is slightly, slightly different. It's fair to say that the Italian... Um, uh, water scheme is, is more related to um, agricultural use. Um, so they have a lot of incentives in terms of um, reducing uh, water for agricultural use, um, desalinization of, of um, coastal areas. Um, not that I can read this from here. Um, and they also have access to um, some of the, the EU funding for um, agricultural programs, which the, the Italian program will, will be able to, to dip into. Uh, Spain, uh, similar situation in Spain. Again, the, 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 the focus is very much on um, agricultural use. Um, again, Italy and Spain have some domestic programs, but uh, in Spain, uh, again, it's, it's the, the use of um, trying, to, 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 re, uh, trying to, to reduce the use of, of water in um, irrigation systems, to increase the use of, of wastewater, uh, and to promote sustainable farming. Probably the, the, the difference between Italy and Spain is that, unlike Italy, um, Spain is very much more based on a, a, a regional funding mechanism. Um, 
So if you see there in, in um, Valencia, uh, I think it's about I think it's about 7.8 million euros. Canary Islands about 6 million euros. Unfortunately, Mercia only seems to have about 1.6 million euros. So I don't quite know what Mercia did wrong, but whatever it is, they, they haven't quite got the same funding. So Spain is very much regional um, funding. Uh, move on. Conscious of this, that I think this has been um, explained in, in to some degree so far, and something that, that I think is quite stark in that, for the Indian perspective, 85% um, of the, the water use is in agriculture. Um, still quite a, a high loss in, in agriculture because of um, losses in, in unlined systems. Um, can't read the rest of it from here. Um, but also losses in um, some of the practices in terms of, of irrigation. Um, it's also um, obviously losses in the, the, the um, uh, domestic pipe work, in, in domestic supply, municipal supply systems, and also obviously losses you can see there in terms of the amount of water that's used in um, industrial water consumption. Another thing I think has been, been touched on already is the, um, the actual um, water demand in, in India. Um, this was a slide that, that was, um, I'm very thankful to colleagues at Terry who um, helped produce this slide, um, shows the, the, the rising demand in, in water consumption in India, um, I think from 2000 and, it was about 2005 there to, to um, 2050. Um, if you look at that, and if my maths on this slide are correct, um, there's a problem at about 2027, 2028, where, where water demand actually exceeds the available resources in, in the country. So, again, it's obviously something that, that everybody's aware of, and, and obviously India is not the only country that has similar problems, that water scarcity is, is going to become something that is of vital importance to, to all of us. Just moving on very quickly to, to what synergists do in the UK. Um, Effectively, we work with water companies across the UK to help them deliver the government targets um, to deliver water savings through um, mainly domestic um, water efficiency programs. And as you can see there, on average, um, we save about 50 litres of water per day per household from water saving programs within the, the UK that we've been involved with. I'll go through this slide very quickly because it's, it's not necessarily of interest to everyone. Some of the products that we, we tend to use in the, the, the water saving um, programs that we use, um, one is a, a shower flow restrictor, um, uh, low flow shower heads, um, conversion dual flush systems, and a good old favorite, as I've always known it, is the HIPPO, which is effectively a water displacement device for systems, all of which are very simple, all of which are very easy to install, and all of which provide very good water savings. Come on to the, 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 the main thrust of our involvement with, with Terry over the, the last sort of 12 to 18 months, I would say. Um, and that's basically our dynamic flow control, um, a device known as HL2024. Um, the graph there shows you basically the, the, the performance of the unit. Um, and it is one of the very few units on the market that is actually um, qualified as pressure independent flow control. That's been done by Kiwa, who are the, the European um, body for um, water testing products. Um, and you can see from that graph at about one and a half bar where the, the unit enters its, its operating range, essentially, that it is effectively pressure independent. It controls the flow, irrespective of upstream pressure, to within 2% of the, the figure that the insert is designed to, to, to control flow to. That's the, the, the unit that we, that we have currently um, on test in, in India. We're, we're working with, with Jane Irrigation. Um, we've had a, a, a test field at their um, Jalgon site, Plastic Park, controlled set point uh, with minimal variation in, um, in, the, the, uh, in the, the flow rate, regardless of the, the upstream pressure variations. Uh, and just very quickly, other uses. Um, Obviously, where you can control the flow through, through devices, you can use it to balance fluid flow systems. Um, we use it extensively in the UK um, to control the water flow through um, the mains cold water system in domestic hot water systems. 
That's a specific use that we have in, in district heating schemes. Um, there are water washing applications, which is used with KLM, where they have fairly stringent um, restrictions on the amount of water they can use to wash their planes. So we have a, a unit that, that we have designed for them, which allows them to, to control that flow of water. And the other one really is, is anywhere in, in municipal water systems where you need to regulate the water flow to, to each consumer on the system. And the beauty of that is if, if you know that the maximum flow to each of those users is predetermined, then it allows you to design in energy efficiency, pipe work efficiency, allows you to design the system with confidence without having to oversize pipe work for unexpected um, increases in the, in the, the flow through, through each of the users. Um, so that's it really, that, that, is, that is OptiFlow, the, the, the product is available um, and interested if, if anybody wants to talk about it afterwards, just please come and see me. And that's it, and that's, that's us basically. Thank you very much for your time. Now I invite, yes, yeah, please go there. Girish Mohan from the ITC. Yeah. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very glad to be here. Yeah, that's fine. I'd like to thank uh, the Bengal Chambers to inviting us to this uh, platform. I'll try to give you a slightly different perspective of outside the fence and try to give you a perspective of you know, how industry or a business can, can create a water security scenario within, uh, not just uh, uh, within its operation, but outside the fence also. Uh, as we all understand, there are three major daunting challenges as a society we are facing today. One is uh, uh, providing food security to our people, water security and livelihood security. The future of uh, business and societal progress are actually intertwined. And one can't really succeed at the cost of others. In fact, in ITC, we very strongly believe that uh, businesses have the capacity to create transformative Im impact provided the value creation is redefined and the societal value creation is kept as a part of core business strategy and this thought has led us uh, uh, to adopt triple bottom line approach of focusing on on uh, environment social and uh, uh, economic capital as a result of that uh, we are a water positive carbon positive and solid waste recycling positive corporation for over a decade now we started our water stewardship journey uh, around 2001 when, uh, when we really started looking very seriously, not just our own water footprint, but also outside the fence where we are operating. So over f uh, last 16 uh, years or so, although we continue to be a water positive company, but uh, water security still remains a challenge in the, in the areas where we operate, largely because uh, you know, there are other co-dependent on same source of water. Many of them are not water positive. We all know that industry gets water allocation from government, but whenever there is a crisis, uh, uh, drinking water followed by irrigation water is given a logical uh, priority, and industry only gets water when other needs are fulfilled. In other words, that your need can only be fulfilled when others' need are, you know, met uh, met with. So. For your own water security, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, very important to understand that others' water security is also uh, fulfilled. And with this, we thought this is a business sustainability case for us. And we started investing on water security in a, in a larger scale with an objective to water for all today and tomorrow, including water for environment, uh, because environmental flows are also important to sustain biodiversity in this production system. Uh, Although we might be getting a secure allocation from, what, from government, but unless the source which is supplying water to us is secured, this water security will not last for a long. This is just one example I want to give you from one of our catchment. This is from Upper Bhavani uh, River Basin catchment of uh, Kisna, uh, Kaveri Basin, sorry. 
and we have a production unit over there. We get a secure water supply from government. And you can see uh, when we did a water balance for this area, we realized this uh, basin is highly negative with uh, around uh, 41 million cubic meter of annual deficit. So whatever we do uh, for becoming water positive, uh, we at the end of a day, we won't get a water unless this issue is being addressed at a large scale. And you can see uh, agriculture is the highest uh, water taker in this entire catchment. And uh, the reason for being water deficit uh, basin is because uh, people have shifted from uh, one crop to other crop, which is high uh, water taking, and there is a deforestation in upper reaches of uh, uh, hills, which uh, is primarily Kerala uh, region. So we thought it's always important to have a water security scenario built in such uh, 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 locations where we operate. And whenever we think about water security, we always tend to work on supply side of water. Whereas uh, it's always important, in fact, we can say that it's more important to work on other side of uh, uh, water security, which is managing demand. And there are other aspects of water security in supply side also, which we need to focus on. And I'll like to touch upon two, three such aspects where we are working in uh, our own catchment. So one is a biomass. Uh, we all understand that, uh, you know, uh, creating water bodies is one solution, but that's not the ultimate solution. In fact, soil is a medium which can store maximum number of, you know, the quantity of water in the form of soil moisture. And that can only happen when biomass of the area is improved. Because biomass acts as a, uh, as a sponge, and whenever there is an excess rain, then uh, it, uh, it holds it. And whenever there is a less stress or less uh, water availability, it releases in the form of subsurface flow. Uh, second is the uh, groundwater. We in earlier uh, uh, session also it was uh, you know talked about how groundwater is going down. One of the reason is aggressive uh, extraction of groundwater. Other reason is the climate variability. We have a high number of uh, high intensity of rain with a less number of uh, rainy days. So the natural recharge which used to happen earlier is actually not happening nowadays. Uh, we really need to identify such areas where we can. Uh, initiate targeted recharge. So we have started taking this in a big way. And third, which we feel is a solution, is uh, improving water use uh, efficiency. We know most of the river basin in India are already ha or have already uh, negative water balance. So the only way to achieve positive water balance is to manage our demand in agriculture sector. And uh, this can happen if we, you know, choose this, uh, this intervention very, very wisely. I'll try to give you some example from our own, uh, uh, our own operations where we, in our catchment, took one or two major crop which take, uh, you know, maximum of water and we started focusing on one or two technologies that can save water, improve water use efficiency and reduce cost of cultivation. As a result of this, uh, in one year period, we could save some uh, 81 million cubic meter of water. As I said, we started our water stewardship journey in 2001. And in, uh, in 18 years, we have created more than 15,000 water bodies. But if I compare the storage potential created by those 15, more than 15,000 water bodies, it's uh, around 55 million cubic meter. Whereas in one year, uh, demand management work can give you around 18 uh, million, 81 million cubic meter of water. So you can understand the potential which lies here, and this is uh, something which needs to be focused if you want to achieve water security. Uh, we thought if you know this uh, island of excellence needs to be taken in a larger scale, and for accelerated and large scale replication, we started working on five river basin across India, and these are the river basins where we also have our own operation. That's why we have selected these five river basin. Uh, for uh, you know, for implementation, we have taken two pronged strategy. One is working on sustainability aspects. Sustainability comes uh, with the uh, building and nurturing of a community-based institution, which own and uh, participate in these processes. And scale comes with the partnership, multi-stakeholder uh, holder uh, holder platforms, where you know all the partners are coming together. So we work. We, we are working with the government, many research institutes. NGOs and civil society. And these public-private partnership projects currently have around 2.2 lakh hectare area. And if I am not wrong, that will be somewhere around 10 times uh, the size of uh, Kolkata city. So uh, 
I won't get into this uh, case study because uh, time is limited. The, what I would like to sum up here is that uh, you know, water security is not just looking at your own water uh, security from a narrow lens. It has to be broader water security, otherwise you won't achieve it. Second, the solution is not on supply side, but is on demand side. Third, this can only be achieved if you work on a multi-stakeholder partnership mode. Thank you for listening to me. Thanks. <laughs> Nice point raised in the last, and now I would like to ask uh, uh, anybody have any clarifications from any of the speakers, and you can address uh, the particular speaker. Then it will be better. Yes, please. Yes. Well, I'm S K D from this city. I'd like to know. The quality testing of water done by the company in the state of West Bengal. Some more details, like he has mentioned, it is, they are covering 22 districts, but up to what level? Is it up to block level? Uh, that is one point. Second point: earlier, our state has a very much uh, one particular problem of the groundwater was arsenic. Is it possible to mention what is the status nowadays? Should I go for third question? So let him answer these two first. No. I think those two are too heavy. <laughs> so. Um, I won't be able to uh, share any data with you uh, because I'm not authorized to do it. Uh, but what I can say uh, to answer to your two questions, uh, the first one uh, is about coverage of uh, water sources, right? Uh, to what level? Uh, we have uh, basically built it in the last five years. We have reached out to the Gram Panchayat level. It's not only to the block level, it has gone to the Gram Panchayat level and that's a success story for West Bengal government to the government of India. Uh, the second one, uh, which probably uh, is regarding the arsenic bit, right? And uh, I mean, it's there in the site also. There are 84 blocks affected with arsenic. Uh, I shouldn't say anything much about this, so I'll, I'll keep it to that. Thank you. Uh, someone from there had a question. Very, very, very good evening, sir. Sir. To whom you are asking, please? Sir, uh, one of the speakers during the course of their presentation spoke about the remarkable success achieved by Israel in water management. Would that person elaborate a little bit, other than drip, drip irrigation, a little more? So, uh, I mentioned about the multifarious in, you know, interventions that Israel has taken basically you know, to meet the challenges of rising water demand. Um, it included a combination of interventions, for example, the use of technologies like drip and sprinkler system across the board. They are using not only for agri-irrigation system, but also for any other ornamental purposes or even for their roadside plantation. So it's a very uh, efficiently covered water you know, supply to these uh, water use for these uh, systems. But not only that, as I mentioned to you in, during that time, uh, Israel is also a country which is using as high as around 80% of its wastewater reused into various systems, including agriculture. So uh, the kind of demand that they have for various uses, they are trying to meet it from within the system rather than you know, looking for a newer system. Having said that, they are also the country who are very efficiently looking into desalination technology. They have an enormous amount of water you know, treated through desalination, uh, which is uh, you know, meeting their demand. So these are some of the examples how they are meeting you know, uh, their water you know, needs. Sir, I have a question here. Uh, I am Gunjan Kumar, research scholar from Jadapur University. Uh, sir, my question is with Ansuman, sir. Uh, sir, uh, as you have mentioned, uh, I am looking for details that for commercial building, uh, is India have any benchmarking of water consumption? And second question is, what is our standard uh, where we are as on date with global perspective? 
So, uh, as far as buildings are concerned, look, the water uh, usage is based on, you know, person who is living. So, what is the standard in the urban domain is 135 LPCD. 135 liters per capita per day is what is supposed to be, you know, the kind of consumption that we have. Now, is that the case? Uh, you know, if you look across the cities of the country, uh, in many cases, we do not have even uh, 30, 40 LPCD of water supply for various reasons, not because of the usage within the building, but because of the inefficiency of the distribution system. And in some cases, we have actually probably excess of su supply. All of this actually highlights the fact that at one place where we are not able to, you know, distribute the water efficiently, we need to look into those kind of technology processes, which reduces our losses, manages our demand, is the, is the need of the hour. Uh, but if you look into a particular building, there are various interventions which can be taken to improvise and that, that could be a set of combination of, you know, using efficient, uh, you know, fixtures, uh, taps, uh, saving water, reusing water, all of this is very much a possibility. We have a Terry Griha rating, rating system which actually provides those methodologies if you are happy. Sir, that's why my question is, uh, I'm just supplementing, complimenting question I'm asking here. Uh, rating is existing, but as you know, after five years, we don't know whether rating is platinum or what is existing as on date. My question I want to hear one to little bit more is that if initially it existing means we have given a rating or like a I'm giving a one case like Infosys Infosys have a EPI index and their water consumption level is other building have such kind of benchmarking existing in India as on date I would request you to get it settled uh, beyond the stage sure, so sir. there is a sure, uh, sure. time short okay okay thank you sir I have only one question from which you raised yes Of issues you can say the water theft. Uh, anybody can. Who is the expert in this field? I'm not an expert, but uh, I mean, on a real time basis, what we see uh, while doing water quality testing uh, over all the districts is basically uh, the most important point is taking out water from the pipelines, right? People do it uh, in a normal course in most of the rural areas, and that's how uh, it's basically we call it water theft. That's the actual. Uh, thing that we have seen uh, over the last five years of experience. That's what we call water theft from our part. He said that he is not an expert. We can get it answered later on. So we'll finish it up from here with one conclusion that place where we are sitting ITC, 100% recycling of the wastewater is being done in this hotel. And that's exactly what is one of the solution of the water management. Thank you. We will get the question what is the cost of recycling average in India? No. That is an important thing. I, in, I, can I take one minute? Yes, I'll just get you that. Recycling cost has to be borne by the people who are using it. That is the way to pay back to the nature. Number one. Number two, there is a sponsorship from the Pollution Control Board up to the 5 kg of solar power if you are installing a recyclable plant in your in your pre premises. These are the two things I am at present I am in, get, in, in giving you the answer. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, may we request Mr. Arun Kumar Mukherjee to please present tokens of appreciation to the speakers on the dais. Thank you. So we will move on to the valedictory session, uh, which is need for integrated policy for water. And we have speaker, uh, Dr. Mihir Shah, former member, Planning Commission, Government of India. And session chairperson is Mr. Nitin Desai, Chairman Terry.
My Mr. Mihir Shah. Dr. Mihir Shah is somebody who has been known to us in Delhi for a long time. He has worked extensively in uh, Central India and he continues to work in Central India amongst Adivasis and others. But he's best known in the policy world for the work that he's done on water. He was a member of the uh, Israel Planning Commission where he did a great deal of work on water resources. He also chaired the committee which was set up by the government on the redesigning of, uh, of water institutions, a major committee which has made many very important recommendations on how to reorganize the management of water resources in India. So it's a great privilege for us to have with us Dr. Mihir Shah uh, because there is no better person than him to tell us how we ought to be approaching the management of water resources as we look ahead. Dr. Mihir Shah. My friend, my inspiration, Dr. Nitin Desai, ladies and gentlemen, I am truly grateful to the Bengal Chamber of Commerce and Industry for giving me this opportunity to be with you this evening and to share some thoughts on how we need to redesign water policy in this country going ahead. It's been a very interesting day of discussions and I'll try and touch upon some of the issues that many of you have been concerned about, even agitated about. And I thought I'd begin by focusing on certain principles, certain fundamental principles of how we need to manage water in our country, which we seem to have forgotten. These are the fundamentals of water science, if I may call them that. You know, every one of us in our school textbooks would have studied something called the water cycle. There used to be this diagram. We used to have geography classes in the time Nitin and I were studying. Now it's called EVS or whatever. So every child in this country has been made aware of the water cycle and the interconnectedness of different elements of the water cycle. But it is really a supreme tragedy of water planning in India that the policy makers in charge of water seem to have completely forgotten this fundamental insight into water that we have been taught since our childhood. And in the last 10-15 years, my job has been to remind the policy makers at the highest levels in this country that without remembering the interconnectedness of different elements in the water cycle, we will never be able to manage our water properly. Indeed, what we have today in India is not an actual shortage of water. India has much more water than most other countries in this world. It's because of our mismanagement, because we have forgotten the fundamentals of water science, that we have created a shortage of water when actually there is none. And I'll try and illustrate this. I'll tell you where we have gone wrong, and I'll also try and tell you how we can even at this late stage, even at a time of an enormous water crisis in our country, we can actually turn things around and do it at very low cost. In fact, the solutions are much more low cost and sustainable than the kind of solutions we have followed since independence, which have, in my view, only aggravated the water problem rather than solving it. So when I talk of the interconnectedness of different elements of the water cycle, what are the kind of examples that come to mind? You know, when we look at peninsular India, when we look at our major river systems, the latest studies indicate that most of our rivers are drying up. And if we reflect more carefully on why is it that water flows in our rivers are drying up, we simply must then come to the conclusion that we have forgotten where the water flow in our peninsular rivers comes from. Where does it come from? After the monsoon is over, after the monsoon rains are over, where do our rivers, our peninsular rivers, get their water from? Anyone in the audience who may like to just give a one-word answer? 
No, in the peninsula rivers, the rivers get their post-monsoon flows from groundwater. The base flows that are received by our rivers come from groundwater. Now, in a country where we have a central groundwater board, you know, Nitin was referring to the committee I chaired, the government of India in 2015 asked me to chair a committee to restructure the Central Water Commission and the Central Groundwater Board. Since independence, we have separated groundwater and surface water and looked at them in silos. I call this hydroschizophrenia. It's a phrase you will find in the 12th plan document as well. So what happens is, because of our hydroschizophrenia, we don't realize that if you're going to over-extract groundwater from the catchment area of our rivers, our rivers will not have water flowing in them once the monsoon rains are over. This is a country which has such spiritual value attached to its river systems. We believe that taking dips in our holy rivers will expatiate our sins accumulated over lifetimes. But it seems we have no concern for the rivers whose purity we are committed to protecting, we have not protected the flows of our rivers because we have indulged in over-extraction of groundwater, which has meant that most of our peninsular rivers have either already dried up, their flows have declined, and in a few years' time, the latest scientific studies reveal that these flows will also be almost like a trickle. So how is it that this has happened? The fact is that our groundwater has been over-extracted because we have used indiscriminately the same technology for extracting groundwater from areas with very different kinds of aquifers. So this is the second most important element of our natural resources which I want to bring to your notice, that there is enormous diversity in the aquifer systems, in the groundwater systems that are found in our country, what we have done is to use technologies suitable for the alluvial aquifers. The alluvial aquifers have very high rates of natural recharge. So you extract groundwater from the alluvial aquifers and the water level recovers rapidly. But nearly two-thirds of India is underlain by hard rock formations. So what happens when you use a tube well or a bore well, as it's called in different parts of the country, to extract groundwater from great depths, water takes a very long time to recover its own level. And what we have done is virtually like the mining of groundwater, as many speakers were talking about earlier in the sessions. But we must remember that the aquifers are different in terms of their rates of natural recharge. And so the technology we use, the depths to which we go to extract groundwater, must be very carefully measured and monitored. Otherwise, we will lead not only to a fall in the water tables, not only to a fall in water quality. We are speaking of arsenic in Bengal and Bihar. We are speaking of uranium in Punjab. We are speaking of fluoride in different states of the country. Where has that problem come from? One of the reasons is that we have over-extracted groundwater. We have gone to depths where the rock formations contain these dangerous elements which have now entered the drinking water. In Punjab, there is a train, many of you may be aware. It's called the Cancer Express. It carries patients from the heartland of Punjab to the medical capitals of this country because most of those people are now afflicted by cancer having been drinking the water laced with uranium. So let me come back to the point that if you over-extract groundwater, you are going to lead to a situation where the base flows that kept our river systems alive after the monsoon are going to be exhausted. And this has happened because we have separated the governance of groundwater from the governance of surface water. In a very similar manner, we have separated the governance of drinking water from the governance of irrigation. So it's a welcome step that the government of India has just taken, that they have set up the Jal Shakti Ministry, which at least has made the first step of bringing drinking water and irrigation together. Of course, as I emphasized to the Honorable Minister in a recent presentation I made to him, this is only the first step. We need to ensure that as we make plans for the Jal Jeevan mission, as we try to make this enormous provision, the Honorable Prime Minister announced 
in his Re Republic Day address, the kinds of provisions that the government of India is thinking of making. It's a huge opportunity also for Indian industry, which I want you to alert about. But it's very important to protect source sustainability. What happens typically, what has happened since the Rajiv Gandhi mission was set up more than 30 years ago, you know, when we were committed to providing safe drinking water to every citizen of our country, what has happened is that we have used an aquifer, a groundwater source, to provide drinking water. But this same aquifer is being also used by farmers for irrigation. And once that happens, irrigation consumes far more water than the minuscule amount drinking water uh, consumes. So the same aquifer which was providing the drinking water to that particular habitation is now providing that aquifer is being used for irrigation and therefore the irrigation source has dried up. In, if you look at the reports of the Ministry of Drinking Water over the years you will find a table which tells you okay 90% of India's habitations have now been provided with safe drinking water but three pages later if you turn the pages, you will find something very, it's a strange nomenclature which only used in India. It's called slipped back habitations. Habitations have slipped back. Those which had safe drinking water sources are now slipped back because the same aquifer which the government is used to provide drinking water to the citizens of that habitation, now that is being used for irrigation. So the drinking water source has dried up. So this hydroschizophrenia must end. In my report, what we have recommended is that the government needs to set up a national water commission which brings the Central Water Commission and the Central Groundwater Board together. They have to work in close coordination with each other. In fact, they have to work on the basis of a unitary understanding of the water cycle. And that requires not just that there are civil engineers and hydrogeologists, but other water professionals, water has to be treated in a transdisciplinary manner where there is the whole question of managing water sustainably. There is agronomy because as was highlighted earlier, the demand for water has to be brought down and for that we need to change the cropping pattern that we have in our country and I'll just come to that in a minute. So we need agronomists, we need river ecologists, we need people who understand river systems because if we want to protect our rivers, if we want to rejuvenate our rivers, we have to have people who understand river ecology, the environmental flows in rivers, and the interconnection of that with the water that we are extracting from the ground and the water that is being used as surface water for irrigation. That holistic, whole systems view of water, the integrated view of water, has to dictate water policy in our country, without which if with one hand we try to solve a problem, with the other hand we destroy the solution that has been proposed. I often say the left hand of drinking water does not know what the right hand of irrigation is doing. That's the way we have been managing our water resources. So we must understand the interconnectedness of different elements of the water cycle. We must break down the hydroschizophrenia which has characterized water management in our country. And this and this alone will enable us to focus on what people have been rightly arguing since morning, that we have to look at the demand side. We have to reduce the water being consumed in agriculture, which according to the FAO's latest Aquastat database, is as high as 90%. 90% of India's water is being consumed for irrigation. Now, I heard some statements in the afternoon that you know, we have to reduce the amount being used in agriculture because we have to provide it to industry. I would strongly advise everyone in this room not to make the point in that way. Because the way we make the point is extremely important. As you can all understand, water is an extremely sensitive issue. And the farmers are the backbone of India's food security. So there should be no suggestion that we are taking away water from the farmers and giving it to industry. And I'll tell you how we can reduce the demand for water in agriculture without actually in any way either endangering water security for the farmers or food security for the nation. And my point is, and Nitin will appreciate as economists, we understand, you know, where, why do farmers grow water intensive crops? Now everyone in the country has developed this habit of repeating the fact 
that India's farmers are growing better, very water intensive crops. You know, it's a fact. If you look at the total water consumed in agriculture, there are three crops. There are three crops which take up 80% of farm water. Which are those crops? I think everyone in this room knows. They are rice, wheat and sugarcane. Why do farmers grow these three crops principally across the country? Why is it that 80% of our irrigation of water is going to rice, wheat and sugarcane? A simple answer from an economist would be that the farmers grow what we have incentivized them to grow. It's the structure of incentives that we have set up for the last 50 years in this country that have made the farmers grow rice and wheat at the scale at which they are growing. Imagine growing summer paddy in Punjab. It's absolutely an insane idea. But that's where we have pushed the farmers to go. And why is that? What, is, what do I mean when I say we have incentivized them? If you look at the market for our crops, if you look at the crops that the government procures, more than 90% of government procurement at minimum support prices from farmers is for rice and wheat in this country. After the Green Revolution, it was very important. I'm not here to deride the Green Revolution or its achievements in ensuring national food security for this country. Today, we don't have to go with a begging bowl as Mrs. Gandhi had to go to the United States in the 1960s. And it is a matter of pride that as a nation, we decided to embark on the Green Revolution and made the country self-sufficient in food. But it's also important to remember it's 50 years since that day. Are we going to continue the same pattern of farming in this country and continue to see an artificial water crisis being created not only for the farmers but for every person living in India? So what is the answer? How do we change this? Do we give moral lectures to our farmers that look, you need to think of your own water situation and the water situation of the country. We are a rapidly industrializing and urbanizing nation. So you need to give up the kind of water you're consuming. I think that doesn't make sense. But there is actually a very simple solution. And over the last few months, I've been urging the government of India to rapidly move in that direction. This is a solution which will not only solve the water problem in our country, it will also address the major health crisis that India is facing. What are the major health issues that are facing the country in the last 30 years? There's a new crisis of diabetes that this nation is facing. We are becoming the diabetes hotspot of the world. The number of diabetics in this country is slated to double by the year 2030. It is already the highest number in the world. And what lies behind this diabetes epidemic also is the kind of food we have been eating, the kind of ultra-processed food made essentially out of wheat and rice that we have been consuming. And the other major crisis, of course, is the crisis of cancer, which I mentioned earlier. Cancer now is taking so many lives in our country. We definitely need to move beyond the kind of farming that we are doing in India in order also to address the health crisis that we are facing. So what is it that we can do? My simple answer is, in an enterprise such as agriculture, you know, many of you, I'm sure all of you, are investors in the stock market. What is the fundamental principle that anybody who advises you to invest in the stock market tells you? What is the way to minimize risk in a volatile market? It's to diversify your portfolio, right? It's, you have to have a diverse portfolio of stocks. You cannot put all your eggs in one basket. Now, that's a stock market for you. Think of agriculture. Agriculture has not only a market risk, but also the risk of the weather. Imagine such a risky enterprise, and what have we compelled our farmers to do? Since the Green Revolution, the farmers have adopted monoculture. Monoculture is an ecologically disastrous option because it reduces the resilience of the farm system to external risk. And of course, it reduces the resilience of the farm system to market risk. So we need to diversify our farm portfolio. But how do we do it? The simple answer is, again as an economist, incentivize diversification. 
How do you incentivize diversification? Whenever I make this proposal, I say we need to introduce millets and pulses into our cropping pattern. The question that is thrown back at me is, what will we do with all these millets and pulses? My answer is simple. Government should procure millets and pulses in, from those regions of India, which are the dry land regions where the rainfall patterns don't permit this kind of excessive use of water for growing water intensive crops. And having procured that, supply it into the integrated child development services and the midday meal scheme, the largest nutrition programs for children ever in human history. You know, however much millets and pulses we may grow, we will never be able to meet the demand of the children of this country if we have to save the next generation from going into the diabetic treadmill. We have to change the dietary patterns and the best way of doing it is to introduce these millets and pulses, the different kinds of oil seeds which India has traditionally had in such abundance, which we have forgotten in this chase after the Green Revolution. I have lived in central India, as Nitin said, and that region witnessed the soybean revolution over the last 30 years. Do you know what's happened to soybean in Madhya Pradesh? It's been an unmitigated disaster. And why? Because Brazil and Argentina, our competitors in the market, what do you do with soybean? Basically, you export the oil and the oil cake. We are no longer able to compete in the international market because Brazil and Argentina have lowered their cost of production and our farmers, the soybean farmers, are getting wiped out. We need to diversify, therefore, into a multiplicity of crops, those crops which are suited to the agroecological regions of different parts of the country, public procurement by government, and introducing them into the ICDS, the midday meal, and the public distribution system, where we can make these grains available at low cost to every person who lives in this country. So what do we do? In one stroke, we reduce the demand for water in agriculture, we actually open up the possibility of doubling farm incomes. You know, doubling farm incomes is the great challenge that the Honorable Prime Minister has set this country. But do you know what's happening to farmer incomes today? With the kind of agriculture, the kind of agricultural technology, the cost of inputs, the chemical fertilizers and pesticides, which make a mockery of all our claims to sustainability, they are skyrocketing. Today, farmer incomes are going into red zone, they are becoming negative. We have had in the last 30 years 300,000 suicides by farmers. You know, India has always known agrarian distress. People have been hungry, there have been famines, but there has never been this phenomenon of farmer suicides. And what lies behind this is the fact that we are continuing to use an antiquated 50-year-old technology which we need to overthrow. I'm very happy to say that the finance minister in a maiden budget speech has spoken about the need to move towards ecologically more sound approach to farming. Sometimes it's called natural farming, it's called conservation agriculture, it's called low external input sustainable agriculture. The principle is the same. We need to reduce the demand for water and agriculture, we need to reduce the use of chemical fertilizers and pesticides which are no longer giving us the kind of yield response that they were giving in the early years of the Green Revolution, which is why farmers are having to buy more and more expensive inputs, not getting the requisite production, therefore not getting the kind of profitability from farming which they were getting in the early years of the Green Revolution. So we cannot continue with the old paradigm of farming. We cannot continue with the old paradigm of water management. We have to move towards crop diversification, reduce the demand for water and agriculture. And yes, without endangering farm security, we can release water for urban areas and industry if we do that. So we have clear-cut, simply implementable. Nitin, I'm always exercised about preferring solutions which a policymaker can adopt. It's all very well for us in these seminars to talk of very difficult solutions, you know, talk of what is ultimately good for the planet, etc. But what a politician, what a policymaker requires is easily implementable, 
doable actions. And I think the, what I'm describing to you is an agenda which I've been sitting with the Honorable Minister for Water Resources, who seems to be an extraordinary uh, new minister. And he was earlier the Minister of State for Agriculture. And he's extremely excited about this option. We, again, will need to put the Ministry of Water Resources to sit together with the Ministry of Food and, they will, and the Ministry of Agriculture. If they sit together, and take a coordinated set of actions, I think we will be very much uh, <clears throat> in the direction of solving India's water problem. The same kind of economy in water use has to be exercised by Indian industry. You know, there were some questions, and I'll take an opportunity to answer one of the questions, which was about the cost of recycling. And I don't think the panel had the time to answer that question adequately. I'd like to uh, take a few minutes on that. You know, India has the highest water footprint in its industrial sector in the world. We have been spoiled by the way we are guzzling fresh water without a thought. By the way, ITC is an exception, as somebody pointed out. There are a few business houses. I work closely with FIKI, and I'd be very happy to work with the Bengal Chamber of Commerce and Industry to actually move our industrial sector in the direction of sustainability, of reducing its water footprint. The question is, the question that was asked is, is it not a very expensive option? Now again, I'm sorry I'm an economist. I say I'm sorry because economists and engineers have done a lot of damage to the planet, as you all know, uh, especially in the last hundred years. But it is very important to understand the economics of water recycling. The calculations that Terry itself has done, it was actually being shown in the presentation in the afternoon. I don't think it was emphasized adequately. The Terry study itself, many other studies showed, studies I did when I was in the Planning Commission show, that the buyback, the payback period, the payback period of these investments which industry makes is not more than three years. You know, we saw the slides on thermal power. Thermal power is taking up 80% of industrial water use in India. And it's completely, you know, a no-brainer. Because all over the world, these technologies are being adopted. Even in India, they are beginning to be adopted. They do not cost. As I said, beyond three years, you will not take to recoup your investment. But what is happening is, because you are not pricing water adequately, because water is easily available to industry, again we have created the distorted structure of incentives, which is actually enabling the industrial water sector to consume much more than it needs to. So the water footprint is high both because we are consuming excessive amounts of fresh water and also because we are dumping untreated wastewater into the environment, into the groundwater, into our rivers. You know, the Pollution Control Board uh, chair was here. I was amazed by the, his presentation. It was such an extraordinarily refreshing thing to hear uh, somebody from the water establishment speaking a new language. But it is also true, and the Pollution Control Board has to see that we have not been able to actually play our role as a pollution controller, as a regulator, because we are still in the old mindset of the license quota permit raj. That is not going to work. We are not going to be able to go and police people. It has only spawned the political economy of corruption. What we need to do is to create knowledge institutions. And I urge the Bengal Chamber to be a knowledge institution for the industrial sector in the state to actually enable people to get the software, to get the understanding of how you can reduce the water footprint of industry in this state. It's not rocket science. It's something, it's well known. It's something that needs to be adopted. The adoption has to be facilitated. I don't think we need to even provide the kind of incentives which the Pollution Control Board is providing because it's in the enlightened self-interest of industry to adopt water-saving, water-recycling technologies. Let me tell you one thing. We have had an easy ride so far. But the farmers of this country are getting increasingly agitated. We have farmers' agitations on the streets. The citizens are getting agitated. And there are so many instances now. I go across the country. I find industrial units being shut down in the summer. Why? Only because of lack of water. So I think it's a wake-up call, the water crisis. As we know, in the 90s, we had a crisis, and that led to the kind of reforms we initiated. In my presentation to the Prime Minister's office, I said, this is our 1991 moment in water. Let's adopt 
the water reform which we should have probably adopted 30 years ago if we can do that we can still turn the situation around on the ground but to conclude what i wanted to share with you finally is that i don't think this matter can be left to the government alone water is too large for any government to handle on its own what we need and you know if you see the honorable minister statements i'm very heartened to say he is speaking of a jan andolan for water a people's movement for water we need to make water a concern of every individual in this country and for that there have to be champions there have to be champions in civil society there have to be champions in academia there have to be champions in the chambers of commerce and industry and again i urge the bengal chamber to take the lead in becoming the harbinger for water reforms not only in bengal but across the country i recently had the good fortune of drafting the karnataka state water policy and what i want to emphasize also in the end is that every part of this country every state not only every state every aquifer and every watershed every river basin in this country has unique properties the policies that we adopt should not be sort of a top down document imposed upon all the states it must grow organically from the ground in every river basin of this country that is what i am urging the honorable minister to take the national water commission to locate it in every river basin of india not to be located in new delhi to give up <coughs> this old paradigm of centralized water management to actually <coughs> make it a people's movement in every river basin in every aquifer in every watershed we need to get the people together and for that as i said they need to be leaders they need to be champions and i'm here i believe i did not expect the kind of enlightened consciousness that i have found in this room <coughs> from the bengal chamber of commerce and i would again request you and urge you i think there is a moment which offers great opportunities if we were to seize it i would say let's join together let's push for this paradigm shift and policy must reflect the realities of water on the ground i think there is a crisis the crisis gives us a great opportunity to make the paradigm shift happen let's do it together thank you very much let me Uh, let me thank Dr. Mirza for a wonderful valedictory address where he has brought together many uh, dimensions. It was a one very good way of ending the, this particular exercise, which is really con going to contribute to our World Sustainable Development uh, Summit. If I may say a word or two uh, to comment on your thing, it's uh, very interesting that uh, you mentioned uh, diabetes. And in many ways, what that illustrates is something which is at the, what was the core of your argument, that policies which were right for one in context are no longer right now. In the case of diabetes, so do we as Indians have inherited something called a thrifty gene. We grew up in a, world, in a country where it were, there were frequent famines, and this particular gene is the one which adjusts your metabol metabolism to be allowed you to cope with famines. Now that same gene, in a situation in which you don't have food scarcity, has a perverse effect of creating, say, high triglycerides, risk of type 2 diabetes, etc., etc. So something which made a lot of sense for survival at one time is today a threat to survival. And what he's telling us is that uh, you have, it, it, when we were at independence, our water availability was 5,000 cubic meters per head. By any standard, that is very generous. Today, it is below 1,700. And by international standards, that places us as a country in a water stress situation. And there are parts which are even below that, below 1,000 cubic meters, which by international standards is water scarce, not just water stress uh, situation. So we had a policy of water use, which was fine in a time when there was no real shortage of water, by and large. 
But we have not changed that policy when we are facing an environment when there are serious shortages of water. We had a water policy which worked when most of the water use was basically for a little bit for irrigation. We really didn't have too many big dams in those days. So it was mostly run of the river irrigation. Uh, certainly some for drinking water, low level of urban. Today the structure has changed completely. And yet we, can, we have not changed the way in which we manage water from that time. Similarly, in the case of agriculture, we are designing agricultural policy to cope with the huge food shortages of the mid-60s when we were dependent on shipments from the United States. And that's what drove the special incentives for rice and wheat and so on. But that's not the situation today. And we're still continuing with the same structure, the same policy. So as he says, we need a paradigm shift. We need a paradigm shift and recognize that we are operating in a different environment. He's also stressed what I think has been the message of this whole session, the interconnectedness of things. He's spoken, talking of water, he's spoken of nutrition policy, agricultural policy. Uh, in fact, he, in a way, he also de de dealt with the areas of industrial policy, energy policy. I would even argue trade policy. People say you're exporting water. Yeah? When you export sugarcane, you're exporting water. And that's a water-scarce country exporting water. So I would say that uh, it's a very, uh, what, we, the con what we end up with as we end this session is the centrality of addressing the water issue. Water is essential to life. You and I are made 60% of water. When I go, I'll be returning 50 liters of water back to the hydrological cycle. Uh, water is a, a shared resource. But we have no real mechanisms for bringing together the people who are sharing this resource. At the village level where they may share a pond or a reservoir, the old institutions have now collapsed. At the aquifer level, we in fact have not even mapped our aquifers properly so that we can bring all aquifer users together in the framework. And at the river basin level, since most of our rivers are inter-country, inter-state in nature, we have not successfully organized a mechanism for integ fully integrated river basin management. So it's a shared resource for which we need to uh, address something. And most important, it's a strategic resource, as he explained to us, that if we address water resources correctly, we will be compelled to get many other things right also. So this, I think, is a broad message that comes from our session in this afternoon. And I look forward to this receiving even uh, more attention when we meet in the World Sustainable Development Summit uh, a few months uh, from now. Uh, with this, may I request the organizer, is somebody here, Zumde, Annapurna, yeah, uh, to come here. That's it. So that's the validity section. It comes to an end now. Thank you, sirs. May we request Mr. Debe Mukherjee to please present memento to Dr. Mihir Shah. Ladies and gentlemen, the 13th edition of the Environment and Energy Conclave will be held in the month of August as it is always held in the next year. And the date would be communicated to you in due course. And I would request uh, Dr. Annapurna Vanchaswaran to please, uh, she would like to share something. So do please come to the podium. So I think it's our time, turn to give a final thank you to the Bengal Chamber of Commerce and Industries. May I request Mr. Arun Mukherjee, Mr. Deb Mukherjee to join us here. And may I request Dr. Mathur to give a token of appreciation for your support and your wonderful partnership. Ongana, could I have you also here? We wouldn't have done without you, uh, with your direct. And Suchismita, please join us. Up on stage. 
Please give him a give a round of applause to the Bengal Chamber of Commerce and Industries.